Yeah. All right, Chelsea. All right. Let's see. Are we has everybody entered? I can't see the background of the Zoom. Cheryl, has everyone entered? All set. We have okay. we have 78, 79 people still admitting. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, as we get started, um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the Composting Basics and Science of Compost webinar. Um, if you can mute yourself, please do. We will try to mute you, but if you can do it, that would be great. Um, this is the first of three webinars um, on a variety of aspects of composting hosted by the Connecticut Compost Alliance. Let me move to the next slide. Um, I will let you read the Compost Alliance mission below while introducing myself. Uh, my name is Chelsea Hahn. I am a member of the Connecticut Compost Alliance, and I'm a part of the Sustainable Materials Management Group at Connecticut Deep. Um, and it's my pleasure to kick off this year's webinar series, um, which have stemmed from our planned and canceled conference from back in May 2020 um, or March 2020, in the spring of 2020. Um, and we've been virtual ever since. Uh, we put together a webinar, a webinar series last year that was wonderful and we're very excited for this year's webinar series. And let me move slides. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to access it again so you don't have to hurt your hand writing notes. Um, you can listen back anytime um, and please keep your microphones muted unless you're sharing information or asking a question. And um, after the webinar is finished, you will get an evaluation that is really, really vital to fill out. So please do so if you can. Um, and today we are covering a few things. We have two different speakers. Um, our agenda includes this welcome. Um, and we're gonna go, we'll hear from Don Pettinelli from the Yukon Soil Nutrient Analysis Lab um, from Yukon Extension on the basics of composting. Then we'll have a little stretch break around 4.30. Um, and then we will hear from Dr. Rafka um, on mm -hmm. the science of compost. So it's a wonderful uh, afternoon of composting. Uh, and additionally, we have a couple more webinars in this series. The next two Wednesdays, March 30th from three to six, we will be um, covering track two, which will be on farm composting and biochar and compost. And then finally, on April 6th, we will have track three, which, which will be large municipal commercial composting. Both really exciting. And, and Chelsea, I put a link in the chat function. Okay. So if people want to go to the web page where both the recordings will be placed, as well as registration for the upcoming program. Thank you so much. And Cheryl is my is my co-host for this evening um, and my colleague at Connecticut Deep. Um, I'm very fortunate to have her helping run with the run the Zoom. Um, so next in the series, we're actually having field trips or tours uh, related to all three webinars. Um, on Saturday, April 2nd, we will be going on tours of large and municipal scale composting sites. On Friday, April 29th, we will be attending an on-farm composting tour. And then on Saturdays, May 7th and Saturday, June 25th, um, we will have a tour uh, slash field trip. Um, the same one, just two mm -hmm. options uh, will be for this particular webinar series on home composting. Um, those will require some pre-registration because of limited space, um, but there will be more details to follow. Um, after the presentations today, um, after each presentation today, there will be opportunity for question and answer. Um, and at the end, there will be more details about the webinars and our link to our sustainable CT matching funds, which I will talk about at the end a little bit too. 
Uh, and up now is Don Petinelli. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share, Don. Great. Well, thank you. It's great that we have so many people that are interested in composting. Um, go to slideshow. From the beginning. There we go. So, um, as Chelsea mentioned, this is the first in our series of compost webinars. And, you know, we try to find um, different topics that would interest people on different scales of composting. So, as was mentioned, this is sort of a beginning composting talk, getting started. And yes, it is true. If you have gone to some of my previous composting presentations, some of these same points will be reiterated, but hopefully you'll learn a little bit. We'll think about it. It's springtime. We're gonna be getting out in the garden pretty soon. And it's uh, something that's pretty easy to incorporate into um, most yards, landscapes, even home in terms of worm composting. So, I really like this quote from Dr. Fred Magdoff. He's from UVM and he's written some nice little books on organic matter and stuff. And, you know, I, I believe that composting really is part art, part science. It's, it's there isn't really a, a, a if, if you wanted to, you know, if you're doing it on a large scale, of course you have to be a little bit more specific with it, but basically, you're taking all kinds of organic waste, whether they're food waste, whether they're yard waste, and, and you're encouraging decomposition to occur so that you get a really good valuable product for your, for your, your gardens and your lawns. And, but all it is, it's really chemistry. So it's, you know, whatever or organic waste you have, you have soil organisms, they need oxygen and they need water, and then they'll produce carbon dioxide, they'll produce some more water, they'll produce heat, and they'll produce compost. So it's really, it's, it's, it sounds more complex. And if you're dealing it on a larger scale, which if you attend the future seminars, you'll learn about, but in the backyard, it's really and truly, there isn't really a, a right or wrong way for the most time. And there's, there's as many recipes I like to think for compost as there are for a zucchini bread. And really and truly, have you ever really had a bad slice of zucchini bread? You know, whether you're making zucchini pineapple bread or zucchini basil cheddar cheese bread or zucchini bread with nuts, they all taste good. Yes, they might have a little bit different. Their recipes a little, a little bit that um, change from one to the other, but the final product is still something that's, that's tasty, delicious. And in the case of compost, it's usable. So, you know, I just wanted to before this is how I kind of got started with composting. I mean, I've been actually composting for like 40 years. And, and, and I, I will admit, since we don't have chickens anymore, I really haven't been into the hot composting as much as I, I was. We, had, we used to have two rabbits when our son was young. We had like five chickens. I don't have a, a, a lot of, um, of, of materials that would cause the pile to heat up and to get a really good carbon nitrogen ratio, which I'll explain in the middle, but for in a, well, in a little bit. But really, the, the, one of the main reasons I got into compost is I hate waste. You know, my grandmother grew up in the Great Depression. And when she lived with my parents after my grandfather died, she would even take the, the, the wax paper from a cereal box after it was emptied and she would use it to like wrap sandwiches. So these are the, I looked through these figures last year for a talk. I don't know if they've been updated. We waste 35 million tons of food a year, and it's been increasing. Back in 1980, only about 10% of our municipal solid waste was um, food. It's twice as much now. You know, people, we throw out, I couldn't believe this, we throw out more food than we throw out paper, plastic, metal, and glass combined. I might believe the paper and the metal and the glass, but it was hard for me to, to um, what do you call it, C conceive that we throw out more food than plastic because there's plastic, plastic everywhere. And that's probably going to get us before anything else. So, so anywhere from 25 to 40% of the food <clears throat> that we grow, that we process, that gets transported across the country is in use. A very small percentage is recycled. 
And they did a study in 2012, and again, I haven't seen a, a more recent one, that almost 13% of Connecticut residents uh, were food insecure, meaning they did not have enough to eat. So there's no point in wasting our food. This really floors me. Every day, we Americans generate enough food to fill a 90,000 feet football stadium. We have got to take responsibilities for the food that we waste. And, and composting is one way to do it. Yes, it's better to not purchase food that you're not going to use, but if we have excess food, much of it can be recycled. So the, the um, what do you call it, in 2010, um, Deep estimated that the, the average resident generates about four pounds of trash daily. It's probably gone up since then, especially with all the stuff we've been using with COVID, which we don't really want to reuse. I, I do understand that. I'm not going to, you know, for with mask and glass and, and all of the medical wear, you're not going to reuse most of it. But that comes to what, 13, uh, 1,370 pounds annually. So, you know, back then before COVID, we're trying to get rid of 2.4 million tons of trash each year. And, and we do really good. You know, my sister is actually visiting from, from Utah. She came for Thanksgiving and she started throwing like the, the um, soda bottle. Well, we, you know, we get seltzer bottles in the trash. I said, why are you putting them in the trash? She goes, well, we don't have recycling for plastics. So everything goes in the trash. So and Connecticut's really good that they do that. And then, and then our landfill space is really filling up. So right now, you know, um, unless something's changed again that I'm not aware of, um, a homeowner wouldn't bag their grass clippings and bring it to the local dump or landfill. It, it is open because um, it's not accepted. I do know that landscapers can get permits to, to get rid of the grass clippings. We actually tell people, leave your grass clippings down unless A, you have a disease or B, they're, you went away on vacation and they're six inches high. And if you just you know, tried to even mulch them, they would either wouldn't be able to do it with your mower or they would um, basically form a, a very thick layer and, and smother your grass. Um, many municipalities do pick up leaves or let homeowners um, bring leaves to their, to their um, site at their end. There's, Last I counted, about like 100 large scale leaf composting operations. Some of them, like Manchester, if any of you guys live in the town of Manchester, they have a wonderful leaf composting operation and they really manage it quite well. Some of the other towns, like my parents used to live in Woodstock, they just kind of got all the leaves and sticks and trees and whatever, and they kind of chopped it up, put it in a big pile, turned it a few times, and any local residents could use it. So you know, why do we even care about, we're going to start comp, talking about composting in just, just a minute, but, you know, why do we care about putting these organic waste materials in landfills? You know, the thing is, when, if they're buried, and, and I know we, we don't have as many landfills as starting to close, we do have more, um, uh, what do you call it, incineration, or if they get put in, I live in Charlton, Massachusetts, right next to me is Southbridge. We get all this, not only construction debris, but other types of municipal solid waste that they're putting into the landfill in Southbridge, which is going to close in the next couple of years. So then what? At any rate, when you bury it, there's no oxygen. So you get anaerobic decomposition. And this is not what we want to do with composting. And, and methane is produced. And methane is like 30 times more potent of a, the, um, than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse um, gas. Plus, it can explode. And also, as these, these um, decomposition processes occur, you can get weak acids and they can create, they can dissolve different materials, say from metals, maybe lead, um, other types of, um, of metals and substances in the soil. And these can, even though, yes, you're supposed to have a special landfill that has special bottoms that things don't leach out, that's not true in all the cases in all the towns. And so realistically, you could be, ca be causing water pollution as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons of why we should think about what organic waste we create, what did it do with the ones that we do create? And one of the things to do is if you can't reduce them is compost. So compost is really a fantastic way to, to recycle organic waste. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but the pH of finished compost is seven. So oftentimes if you're adding compost to your gardens or even if you're top dressing your lawns or you're adding it to some of your other 
ornamental beds. You might not even have to go out and buy any limestone or other types of liming agent to change the pH of the soil because it's gonna be someplace in the neutral. It improves drainage because what happens, um, or, organic matter as it decomposes and soil microbes that decompose the organic matter as, as well as other um, creatures that live in the soil, both plant and animal, they, they exude sticky substances and these sticky substances cause aggregation to occur of soil particles. And if you get good aggregation it, it, in the soil, you're gonna have spaces for um, air and water to move through the soil. So you're gonna be improving the soil's drainage by adding compost. And then compost contains nutrients, right? Because it's decomposed plant and or, organ or animal material. So it's gonna have nutrients. If you, organic matter holds water. So as it holds water, you're gonna have less um, need for watering during drought times. And this is another reason why you don't wanna actually over apply compost because if you have too much compost and you have a really wet, wet season like we did last year, it was hard for it to dry out. Um, Abigail Maynard, Dr. Maynard from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station and, and, and many, many others was looking at, the, at um, plant diseases and if they could be controlled by um, compost. She actually found that cold compost, so this gives us an excuse if you don't really want to turn your pile all the time, cold compost actually has um, a little bit more disease suppressant abilities than hot compost. So that's something that you could, you know, um, think about when you're adding compost to the soil or you're using it as compost tea. And then basically we're, we're keeping these organic wastes out of the waste stream, out of the landfill, out of the incinerator. You know, there's only, everything has a carrying capacity, including the earth. So we're, we're going to try to manage it so that we can um, keep a lot of our organic waste on our, our own properties. So one of the things that people complain about, you know, when you talk to them about composting, they say, ooh, it's going to stink. I don't want to, to do that. I'm going to put food there. It's going to rot. The bottom line is if you do it in a, in, a, in a proper way, and we'll talk about that, you really should not get any odors at all. Yes, it's going to attract some insects because some insects are responsible for breaking down some of the organic matter. Um, if you live in an urban area, I won't tell you that you might not have other animals, including undesirable rodents, but there's many ways that you can make compost bins. And um, I've seen some at some of the schools where they make them pretty much um, the way they, they manage the compost bin and the way they create the compost bin and, and the way that they can keep the creatures out, um, it should not cause a problem. Um, you really, everything's going to rot, right? Everything's going to rot, <laughs> including us. We, you know, we can get composted too after we, we pass on to uh, out of this world. And the thing is, even if you don't have a lot of time to, to, to if you just put stuff in a pile, it is going to rot. And you can get out there and you can create conditions for compost to decompose in a, a, a quicker manner, that's a good thing. But even if you don't, it's going to rot eventually. And you don't need a lot of land. You can get one of those small, smaller plastic bins that are, that are like three, or three and a half by, by um, four or something like that. Or if you don't even have any land, if you live in an apartment, but uh, you can you can do vermicomposting and you know, um, and, and the worm bin can pretty much decompose it and that's not outside. And again, it's really hard to get too much compost. First of all, pretty much 50% of what you put into your compost, the, the, the pile is gonna be reduced by about 50% over the course of, you know, six to 12 months. And I'll tell you right now, if you have too much compost, please contact me or another gardening person and I'm sure that they will be able to take it off your hands. So what are the, some of the things that you can compost? You know, obviously your vegetable waste, whether they're straight from the garden or whether they're, they're peels from your potatoes or your cucumbers or even vegetables. I mean, you could cook up um, carrots and as long as you don't have them all saturated in butter or even if you just put a little bit in, you could still put, you have two spoonfuls of cooked carrots or you have like one leftover baked potato, you can still put that in there. Again, we don't recommend that you put grass clippings in your compost pile unless you need a source of nitrogen, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. We'd rather have you leave it on the lawn because 
Um, the research that they've done at UConn indicates that you're leaving your clippings down supplies about one third of the nutrients or especially the nitrogen the plants need. But again, sometimes it's too high. Sometimes you just need a source of nitrogen for your, your um, compost pile and you could put a bag around your lawnmower and pick up a few bags and dump it in there. Um, leaves, is there, is there really almost anybody in Connecticut that does not have enough leaves? And I'm sure that if you don't, your neighbors would be more than grateful if you went over and helped them pick up their leaves. When you're doing, you know, little trimmings, even pine needles, you know, don't worry about, oh, pine needles will make my pile too acidic or oak leaves will make my, pine, my pile too acidic. We have typically acidic soils here in New England. Pine trees and oak trees have learned, have, they've evolved, they've co-evolved to live in these situations through a variety of mechanisms. And because they often, they have co-evolved to live in pretty much nutrient poor, low pH situations, they're gonna pull everything into the leaves before they drop them. So the leaves are, are, are actually not very acidic at all. Coffee grounds. Fresh coffee grounds have a pH of four. Once you put the water through the coffee grounds so you can get your cup of coffee, the pH is like five point something. But again, unless you're going to Starbucks and bringing you know, tons of five gallon containers of used coffee grounds, it's fine to add some there. Um, tea bags, don't worry about taking that little bit of aluminum off. First of all, our soils have tons of aluminum in it anyway. Second of all, it never does any damage. Some of us don't get newspapers anymore, but often most towns have at least like a freebie. Um, and, and then sawdust, you, obviously not from pressure treated wood, but if you're making a birdhouse or a bat house or even or, or something like that, and you have a little bit of sawdust or you, or you get some sawdust in or some wood shavings in with your uh, plants that you're ordering now and they're coming in the mail, dump that in. Manure or bedding, you wouldn't wanna put fresh manure on your vegetable gardens or on most of your beds, unless you're doing it in the fall, but if it's, it, you can put it in your compost pile. Even if you had, like we used to have a, a guinea pig with like um, wood shavings or little pellets and stuff like that. And, you know, he would clean out his cage, everything would go in the compost pile. And I even get rid of some of my junk mail, you know, I'll just shred it up. Some stuff you don't wanna keep old bank statements or whatever. I know most of us are online, but you still get some stuff as long as it doesn't have um, bright, shiny. Um, if it's mostly just paper, it's fine. Um, when, you're, when you're going through your garden, you know, you're going to be end up cutting off the dead flower heads, the leaves that don't look that good. Um, it is good if you, and this is one issue with community gardens, you don't just want to pick like a whole stalk of, I don't know, ragweed or um, some other type of plant that's in your garden and throw the whole thing in there. You'd like to chop it up in pieces. And some of the things that you would avoid is you would avoid not using the, putting in the droppings of meat eating animals like your, your cats and dogs. Um, there is something called a, a green cone and somebody had showed it to me. I, I have not tried using it, but it, it's a cone and it has a basket that looks like a laundry basket on the bottom. You sink that in the ground and you can put like meat scraps and pet droppings and stuff in there. It's not compost. You are not going to use it when it gets filled up. You're, you're just going to bury it and then you're going to put it in another place. I don't know if you had like five German shepherds that this would be some, some good way to get rid of their droppings. But if you just had like a cat or you had a, a couple of some small dogs and then you didn't eat tons and tons of meat, but you had some chicken bones occasionally. And, and to tell you the truth, you know, if we have if we have a drumstick each for dinner and we peel everything off the bone and you just have a dried chicken bone, I will often just crack it up and throw it in there. I live out in the country. We have a lot of, we do have animals. We haven't had anything um, bother our, our um, compost pile. And same thing like if I have a, a pe one piece of cheese left that has some green mold on it, you know, I, I toss it in there and then we have a three bin composter. So I put some leaves over it. Unless you're planning to do a hot compost pile and you can get it up to 140, 150 degrees, you would not put diseased plant material in there. Either A, bury it, or B, put it in a plastic bag and put it out with your trash. Your obviously coal and charcoal ashes, these would have heavy metals in it, you wouldn't use it. You wouldn't be putting the glossy sections of a newspaper or a magazine or the magazines that you keep getting in the mail. You know, you order something once from one catalog and then they sell your name and you get five catalogs that have similar items. 
I just put those in the recycle bin. If your plant material is treated with pesticides or herbicides, you typically would not put it in there. Um, and and um, Dr. Rafka will talk a little bit more probably about persistent herbicides, but um, they could last for, so they, they could degrade, they, they might not degrade, why take the chance? Invasive weeds, what do you do with all the freaking garlic mustard? You know, I, I cut some, I use it for stir fries, I try to pull up what I can, but I wouldn't put any weeds in there. Same thing with like the crack grass. If you, if you could get the something like, um, if you could just get a, a, and if it was an invasive plant and you chopped off the seeds and you chopped off the roots and you just let the leaves kind of dry and they weren't the kind of plant that was going to be able to root from a leaf and you dried it out in the sun, you probably could add it in there. And then obviously sawdust from pressure treated wood, whether it's the old pressure treated wood that was the copper chromium arsenate or even the new stuff, which is copper. And then I think quaternary ammonia, I think I would avoid doing that. So now let's talk a little bit about composting the process itself. In a nutshell, you wanna find a place to put your compost bin. You can either build a bin, you can buy a bin. You're gonna be putting plant in, in and uh, food scraps and possibly animal um, droppings or herbaceous animal droppings in there. Um, you're gonna mix these up. The microbes are gonna need moisture. If you can, you'd like to turn it. And then when it's finished, you're gonna use it in the garden and you're gonna repeat. So that's basically you know, composting 101 in a nutshell. So if, if you want to get your compost pile to decompose in a relatively short period of time, and, and I'm not talking like 30 days, I'm talking about like an outside pile in the Connecticut or Northeast area where you're gonna be filling it up. It's probably gonna take anywhere from six to nine and maybe a little bit longer to actually decompose. Usually everything that we end up composting in, in the throughout the growing season, like for 2021, we're gonna be using in the gardens for 2022. So you're looking for a carbon containing material because that's what gives your, or, your microorganisms the food that they need. Um, you're looking for a nitrogen containing material because that's gonna supply them with the energy that they need. And um, every cell, every single plant and animal cell, whether it's your, your whether it's your, your uh, what do you call it? Something that you're eating like a carrot or a piece of beef or, or even part of your body cell contains carbon and nitrogen. You want aerobic um, decomposition to occur. So you wanna make sure that there, there's gonna be some oxygen. That's often why we turn the pile. Microbes need water, just like we need water. Obviously you're gonna get more um, decomposition when it's a little bit warmer out, just like we don't necessarily wanna be out and gardening when it's like 20 or 30 degrees, but when it's 60, 70 or higher, we're happy to be out there. And you're going to need microbes. Um, microorganisms are, are everywhere. The average person walks around with what three pounds of microbes in and on them. So you don't necessarily have to add any microbes to have a successful compost pile. The, the compost, the compost food web is quite complicated, just like the soil food web is. But basically there are my little laser pointer here. Um, you know, there, there, it, it starts with what we can't see, microscopic organisms like fungal and bacterial and actinomycetes, and these start um, softening, degrading down the material. And then we have consumers that are a little bit larger that we might be able to see easier with maybe a hand lens. And then they, they get a little bit larger and a little bit larger still. So there's a whole variety of creatures that live in the compost food web. And I can't tell you how many people have either called me or sent me pictures. They have these, um, they weren't managing their piles as good as they could. They opened the lid because they're going to put some more food in and they see this whole big pile of squirming maggots and they freak out and they're going to, I'm never going to compost again because these maggots are terrible. Well, first of all, if you kind of like bury the food or mixed it up, you wouldn't have them on top. But yeah, flies lay eggs, eggs hatch out into maggots, maggots decompose organic matter. So while it's not really the prettiest picture in the world, it's not something that you should be overly concerned about. So that's who does the work. It's the microbes. You know, you, you, you see the other organisms. You don't see these organisms that do the, the work. And so microbes are, are your job 
if you want to have a good compost pile, your job is to is to produce conditions that these microbes can do their work so they can start decomposing. Um, you know, of, of, and, and this isn't that we don't really have time to delve into like the whole, you know, soil food web or the compost food web, but you know, bacteria are one of the first ones to, to begin. Bacteria, again, they're, they're everywhere and, and they will start breaking down um, organic matter. They will start softening it. It's like when you, 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 what do you call it? You go in your, your, um, your food bin and you pull out the head of lettuce and it's all like brown and slimy, right? That's like the work of bacteria because they're starting to decompose the tissue. But the thing I find amazing is, can you imagine a teaspoon of topsoil? I mean, how much is a teaspoon? It's so small. It can contain over 50 million bacteria. The amount of microorganisms in the soil just totally 100% floors me. I just cannot believe it. Um, these bacteria, there's a whole bunch of different species. They, they like it better when the pH is closer to neutral, which is good because as I said, if you have a compost pile com composed of a whole bunch of different of, of um, food, food um, waste or organic matter for them, it, it's, it's pretty varied, um, you'll, you'll be able to get a, a pH closer to neutral. So there's, there's a psychophiles and they kind of work when it's really cold, sort of like out today. I kind of think of those as like walkers, you know, it's kind of cold out today. I'll put my jacket on, maybe a scarf and some gloves. And, and I don't really get that warm, but I, I'm warm enough so I can do, I can, I exude a little bit of energy. These, these mesophiles do most of the work. And I kind of think of them a little bit more as maybe being like a, like a jogger, you know, you're, you're out, it's warm out, you have shorts, t-shirt on, they, they end up um, doing a fair amount of work, but they don't get hot enough that they can actually raise the temperature of the pile to kill the organisms. And then we have these, you know, I, I call them like marathon runners, these thermophiles. So once the temperature starts getting, um, once the mesophiles start, start raising the temperature, these bacteria start moving in and they really go for it. They're gonna go for that 26 miles. They're gonna go as fast as they can. And because of the energy in their body, that's what causes the, the um, what do you call it? The pile to heat up. So it's not heated up because it's in the sun. It's because the work of these microorganisms, just like if I said, okay, let's get up and do jumping jacks. And right, you're gonna do a couple jumping jacks. You're not really that hot. You're gonna do a hundred jumping jacks. You're gonna be sweating. And that's the heat that you feel from the pile. So it, the, these, these um, what do you call it? These thermophilic ones, once the temperature, if the conditions are good for these bacteria to proliferate and we get to getting these thermophilic bacteria, they can get the pile up to 140, 160 degrees. And this typically kills most weed seeds and pathogens. If you're a commercial composter, I'm sure you're gonna find out you'll, if you join some of the other webinars, I think you have to get up to like 140 or 150 degrees for three days in a row and you have to do it three separate times so that you, you can be certified that all of the pathogens and all of the, the weed seeds would be killed. Um, so what else? So fungal organisms, they, they our trees actually, our, our native vegetation in Connecticut has formed symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationships with different fungal organisms. So they can tolerate more acidic soils. You've probably seen them if you go into the woods and if you turn over the, the leaves or even if you go, you haven't touched your compost pile for a while and then you go to turn it, you see those little white filaments through there. These are a hyphae. They kind of, they move throughout the pile. That's how the, the, the fungal organism is able to spread out and it's able to, um, what do you call it, break down organic matter. So fungi are, are heterotrophic. That means they cannot make their own food. And so what they do though, which is kind of amazing, is they release enzymes and, and these digestive enzymes that they release, they're able to break down um, different types of, of, of plant structures, especially ones that the bacteria can't like lignin and like cellulose. So they kind of soften the food for, for other organisms. And then we have the actinomyces. These are sort of a combination of um, sort of like a bacteria and fungi. They, they say they might be a type of bacteria, but they have some, they have some um, uh, what do you call it, characteristics, some, some sort of like 
hyphae or growth forms that are more similar to, to fungi. They're actually very, very, very numerous. And they're very important just for not only for decomposition, but also for how humus forms and also for nitrogen fixation. So they, um, uh, what do you call it? They also like to have a soil that has a somewhere pH somewhere close to neutral. Um, they do tolerate dryness. You know, what happens is if the, the pile gets too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, most of the time these organisms don't die. They just go into a dormant phase and they stay there until it's time for them to come back out. This is an interesting organism because it causes potato scab. So I'm not quite sure how many of you grow potatoes and have found scab in there, but it's actually, it's a soil borne disease because of one of these actinomyces. And they also produce antibiotic compounds. I bet you you've heard of streptomycin. Streptomycin comes from the actinomyces in the soil. And there's so many things that we do not know about the soil. You know, I think, oh, who was it now? I'm trying to remember. It was, it was Galileo or it was one of those famous people that said, we know more about the, the stars above us than we know about the earth beneath our feet. And that's it's true. And also this is what gives, you know, it's dry outside, you're gardening and all of a sudden you get one of those rains during the summertime and you know you have that, that really pleasant smell, that aroma, it's because of the actinomyces. Earthworms are also gonna join your, your compost pile for better or for worse. And you don't really have time to go into invasive earthworms, but they're important. They, they, they ingest soil, organic matter, they, it goes through their body, they kind of decompose it, they have bacteria and other microbes in their body and, and their casts are, are, so they're, they're like little um, slow release fertilizer pellets. They're high in bacteria and organic matter and also in nutrients. Um, they, they also feed on the microbes as well as the organic matter. And they're not really eating the soil just to eat dirt, so to speak. What they're doing is they're trying to get the microbes and the organic matter that's mixed in. If you are going to do um, vermicomposting, this is the only species you would want to get in Senia fetida. And I don't know where we're going to be able to get it. I need to look into it. I was getting them. Uh, I run the master composter program and I was getting them for years from the worm ladies of Charleston, um, Rhode Island, but they retired. So I'm looking for sources. If people do have sources, let me know. I found some, but I found one in Arizona and it was kind of far away. So you're gonna be having these organic materials. You want them to rot. How fast will this occur? Well, one, it depends on how coarse the materials is, right? Because realistically, if you just put a log on the side, it's gonna rot in a few years. But if you put sawdust on the other side, it's gonna decompose much faster. It does depend a little bit on you know, how warm the weather is, just like, just like us gardeners, the microbes like to do more stuff when it's warmer out and they work faster. They need moisture, so the pile has to have not too much water, but not too little. They need a source of oxygen. And so this is one of the reasons why we have people, we suggest people turn the pile at least occasionally, or if you have one of those tumblers, you can kind of make it tumble. It depends upon what the carbon nitrogen ratio is, how much carbon versus how much nitrogen is in the different types of materials. And um, we'll talk about that again shortly. And then critical mass. You don't need to have a hot compost pile to dispose of food waste. And many people don't because it does require a lot of work. Not all of us have all this material to pile in. But if you wanted one, you need to reach something called a critical mass. And basically what that is, is your pile has to be big enough so that it's, it, it's buffered from the ambient air temperature. So usually it has to be like at least four by four by four. This is why when you see commercial um, operations, they usually do it in long windrows and the windrows are, are you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 feet wide and they might be 10, 20 feet high. It really depends on what machinery they have. But if you don't have that critical mass, if you just have like this little tiny compost pile and then the temperature drops down to 30, well, guess what? The, set, the temperature in the middle of the pile is gonna be 32. So what are some of the ways you can make stuff smaller? You can use a shredder whether you're doing branches or whether you're doing leaves. Um, in the fall, you can pick up, you put a bagger on your lawnmower and you can pick up the leaves and the grass clippings and, and you can use that in a, um, a what do you call it, for to, to add you know, sources of carbon. Um, 
this person, I wish I had a little bit better picture. This, this person uses a machete and they were chopping up their, their um, waste that they were putting in there. And I suppose if you have like anger management issues, this is a good way to get rid of a lot of frustration. Um, I mostly just use clippers and I, I usually use a five gallon bucket and I'll just be clipping things if it's not dead and not diseased and it doesn't have weed seeds that I wanna put in there, some way that you could shred it. Um, as far as moisture goes, the pile has to be moist enough so that the microbes can stay alive and you're gonna get this microbial activity. One of the problems people have, and this is why they often cover the bin, is if it gets too wet, what happens? The pile goes anaerobic, right? And it stinks. And this, and if people, if you, if it rains too much, like it did last year, or you end up putting in too many wet things, like I showed that picture before, we were having a problem with one of the, the schools and someone asked me to take a look at it. And they just were putting whole pineapples and whole cucumbers and whole things on top of the compost pile. And they weren't mixing it in with wood shavings or leaves or anything. So you just had this pile of wetness and it just rotted and it just stunk. So you would like your pile to be about as um, moist as a well wrung out sponge. And yes, a lot of us don't are kind of squeamish and we don't want to like take a handful of compost because who knows if you're going to have some weird creature jump out at you. But so you could wear, you could wear those mud gloves or something and you'd, you'd want to, it should be like moderately moist and you should be able to like squeeze one drop of water out from it. That's, that's that would be ideal. So again, they need oxygen. When you're turning the pile, it, it, it's like basically, it's, it's like your fire, your log in the fire pace is glowing and, and, you're, and it's like eight o'clock. It's like, oh, I'm kind of getting cold in here. I want to put a couple more logs on the fire. So what would you do? You'd have like a bellows or you'd blow on it a little bit. You fan the flame, you're adding oxygen and then you could put more wood on and the wood would burn. Would burn. If you do have the, the right amount of, um, what do you call it, carbon, the right amount of nitrogen, the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of water, you have microbes and you have a pile that's a, of a critical mass, you, you should actually see the temperature go up pretty quickly within a day or two. Um, so carbon nitrogen, you know, this isn't, it, it shouldn't be a difficult concept, so I'll try to explain it in an easy way. So as I said, every cell has carbon in it and every cell has nitrogen in it. Some, depending upon the organism, whether it's a human organism, whether it's a plant, it's going to have different proportions of carbon to nitrogen. So like a tree, for instance, would have um, much more a piece of wood or a tree would have much more carbon relative to nitrogen, whereas grass clippings would have less. So depending upon what the carbon nitrogen ratio is, it really affects how fast your pile is going to decompose as, as well as the nutrient availability. So what I try to, to uh, a good, I, I think is a good analogy is pretend I gave you all a piece of shredded wheat. It's just dry. I don't know if you remember shredded wheat. My mother used to give it to us because we had seven kids and she thought sweet cereals were too expensive. Needless to say, I don't buy shredded wheat now, but at any rate, if I gave you all a piece of shredded wheat and I said to eat it, now what are you going to do? You're going to take a little bite of it and it's really dry. So you're going to try to just like, you know, moisten it with the saliva in your mouth so you could get it down your throat. So it's going to take you a long time to eat that piece of dry shredded wheat. However, if you poured some milk on it, think of milk as the nitrogen, so think of shredded wheat as, as carbon and milk as nitrogen, it's gonna soften it. So it's gonna make it much more palatable to you and it's gonna make it much more palatable to the microorganisms. So ideally what you'd like is you'd like your, the carbon nitrogen ratio to be about, have about 25 to 30 times as much carbon as it would to nitrogen. So as I mentioned, diff different materials have different carbon nitrogen ratios. So things like sawdust and wood chips might have 100 to 500 times more. For, for every, for every um, molecule of carbon, it would have, um, for, for every molecule of nitrogen, it would have one to 500 times more molecules of carbon. Vegetable scraps decompose pretty fast. It's closer to maybe 15, 20 to one, because what are most vegetables and even fruits? They're mostly water. And then, and then um, you know, so ideally what you'd like to do is you'd like to 
mix in a variety of materials so that the ultimate carbon nitrogen ratio that you would be starting with, again, if you have a pile that's big enough and has the moisture and the aeration required as, as a starting point. So think of carbons as browns and nitrogens as greens, even though manures are brown and they still would be considered a green. And what happens is, is when you, as decomposition goes on, the, the carbon nitrogen ratio usually gets below 20. And that's something that can be measured in a lab. We, we don't really have a good way to do it in our lab, but it can be measured UMaine and Penn State do. So you don't have to guess. You can go type in carbon nitrogen ratios in Google or wherever else you want to go. And then basically what you'd end up doing is, is you could find out, okay, so this has, has you know, coffee grounds has 20 times more carbon than nitrogen. You know, straw has 40 to 100 times. So how, how would I want to do this? Um, Let's just say you were using like grass clippings and leaves. That's actually the carbon nitrogen ratio in the fall when you're picking up grass clippings and leaves is perfect. It's like 25 to 30 to one. As a general rule of thumb, you would put one part of green or nitrogen to two to four parts of brown. But again, I can't give you a complete formula that there, there is, there's a, what is it, the on-farm composting book that gives you really good formulas, how you can calculate it out. So let's say you had one part of green, which was grass clippings, and you had leaves. You would probably do good with having, you know, one to two, but let's say that instead of leaves, you had something like, um, oh, I don't know, um, um, pieces of cardboard, or you had tr uh, prunings from your U hedge or something like that that might have a little bit more carbon. So you might need to add one part of green to four parts of brown. It, it's, it's an experiment that you have to kind of, if you wanna be successful, not that you have to be, anything will rot, but you might wanna note these things down. If, if, if you took the master composter class, I would tell you how to do the math. I find that this one is actually the best. You put in um, the different materials and it doesn't matter what, volume you're using. You could use five gallon buckets. You could use, you know, I have two wheelbarrows full of vegetable scraps and I have four wheelbarrows full of leaves. And um, it doesn't matter what, what the volume is. You put them in and you press the button and it calculates out what your carbon nitrogen is. If you want to get a little bit more scientific, you can go to Washington State or Cornell. And, and they also make some assumptions about the materials that you're using. They make some assumptions about um, the moisture content, because obviously if you don't want to put things in, even if you put in, uh, let's say, you know, one part of lawns and two parts of leaves, if the leaves are like dripping wet, it's probably not going to, it's gonna, probably going to be too moist and you're going to have to turn it and fluff it up and otherwise you're going to get anaerobic decomposition. So let them do the math for you. So then when you're actually ready to build your compost, where do you want to put it? Think about it. I want to put it somewhere where I'm going to use it. If you put it out into the back 40 and it's winter time and you still want to, you don't have a freezer big enough to freeze food scraps or you don't have a garage to put that in, you want to put it where it's going to be used. So you want to put it somewhere that either near the vegetable garden or somewhere that's easily accessible for you to go out there. And you want to put it someplace where you might need to add water, especially if you do have a cover. You don't need to put it in partial shade, but if it is in a hot sunny site, it might dry out a little bit more and you might have to add a little bit more water to it. Again, if you do want hot composting, you need that critical mass. So you're gonna to have to put it someplace where you could have a four by four by four area. If you do think you're gonna have animal pests, you wanna build it in a way to keep the animals out. Or sometimes those, those turning bins have locking doors and will keep most animals out. So you need to think about these things. You can contain your compost any way that works for you. This person just put up some fencing and some, uh, what do you call it, wood. This person, this is not a good way to do it at. They just put some circular wire and they just been throwing all of their weeds or whatever in there. This is not gonna decompose for a very, very long time. I don't know that I would actually call it compost, but more just like a, a waste holding pile. Pallet bins, you know, pallets are, um, what do you call it? I'm not sure now with COVID if they're as easy to get as they were before. They're kind of heavy, but you know, they, they don't look too bad. I've seen some people make some cute little 
compost bins out of them. The thing is there's two kinds, there's, there's heat treated or there's chemical treated. So you would get the ones that say HT and not the ones that say CT for a compost pile. Um, and actually, sadly, they think that, you know, a lot of the problems that we're having, like those, those, those emerald ash borers and those, those, um, those Asian longhorn beetles, they're thinking that they came in on, you know, shipping containers or shipping pallets. They, they don't know for sure. So they should be treated. Snow fencing, you know, again, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but it works. Um, you can just use hardware, like a big, um, you know, metal hardware cloth type stuff you can get in different sizes. This person decided to combine pallets with, with um, cinder blocks. Be as creative as you want. And, you know, they're probably free. You know, that, that the three bin one is, is a custom one that a lot of people strive for. And there's different ways that you can use the three bin one. Um, we, we've been actually using, we, we fill up one bin about two thirds of the way. So it's getting hard to turn anymore. And then we start filling up the second bin. And then the third one, we usually dump in a bunch of leaves or sometimes if I'm in the mood and I've been shredding paper because I'm trying to downsize, you know, get rid of documents and stuff. So then when we put food in, we'll throw some leaves in. Some people use those for turning and they just have like step one, step two, and they use it for curing, whatever works for you. This person made a little wood corral here. I thought this was really cute. They had rabbits and they put compost bins under the rabbits. And supposedly, and we did have rabbits, but we used to compost their waste. And supposedly you could actually use um, rabbit droppings fresh into the garden because they, they're very, they're lower in a lot of nutrients, especially, especially things like ammonia, which would burn your plants. You know, there's all kinds of different drums. There's little ones. Sometimes you see those, um, those little tiny ones. Oh, I'm going to make compost in 21 days. Don't really believe them. Um, my sister had got one of those. And the thing is, people have a tendency, since it's so small, that they stuff it full. So it's, it doesn't have a lot of holes. It's not well aerated. And, and um, there's not a proper amount, is either too much or too little moisture. So these, these bins, you really have to just fill about halfway, make sure your particle sizes are small, make sure that you, you're turning it. One of the directions and one of the bins I saw, is that it says you're supposed to go out there and turn it like every day. I'm not quite sure how many of us have time to do that, especially if we have busy work schedules, but it, this would keep like, probably be more likely to keep, you know, rodents out. And then there's all these, um, you know, these, these plastic ones. So in this case, this is a rotating one and you just push the wheels and it goes around and around and around. These plastic bins are becoming more popular. A lot of the towns are trying to take food waste out of the, um, what do you call it, the waste stream. So I know some of my master composters have been helping out some of the municipalities. They've been having compost bins and rain barrel bins um, sales. And so the, the people order them for like half price. And, and they do, I mean, I'm not telling you an animal can't get in there, but there's a little hole in the bottom. It is a little bit hard to get some of the compost out. Sometimes people have, um, when they when it's filled, it's a little bit harder to turn. So you need one of those, uh, those long turners that you could get like an ocean state or something like that, because you can't really get a pitchfork in them. But again, it looks neat. It's a place to put your waste. It's better than putting it in the trash. So, you know, it's like, why do we layer our compost? And, and you don't necessarily have to, but um, this guy, Sir um, Albert Howard, he, he, was from, um, he was from England and he was sent to, an, uh, uh, to be an agricultural advisor in India a long time ago. And, and you know, he did realize that not necessarily where the way that they were doing agriculture in India, I mean, in England was like the best. And so as he got to know the, the people in India, he, he really believed with all his heart that the soil, the crop, the farmers, the animals were all one, were part of one earth. We're we should all be treated as a single system. And one of the things that they needed there is ways to produce organic matter. So he came up with this layering method and I don't know if this is his exactly, but he would put something a little bit coarse on the bottom, then he'd put leaves, he put kitchen scraps, um, what do you call it? He would use animal manures, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, 
And then he would throw in a little bit of soil because he figured he would use that. And some people do use soil or compost. They'll put a shovel full in to use a starter. He actually put in a sprinkling of lime, but, but as we don't advise you using lime because you don't have to because the pH of finished compost is seven. But at any rate, if you're thinking of doing a hot pile, it almost makes sense to do some layering so you can get some um, sense of the proportion of materials that you're using. And then once they're all layered, you're gonna turn them all because you want them to be all mixed up, but at least you kind of knew what you did. And then you can see after two or three days, if you made this pile and it's like four by four by four, and you turn it after a few days, and the temperature is getting up there, you could say, hey, I did it. This is, this is the way I want to go. If it's not doing anything at all, we'll talk about troubleshooting in, in just a few minutes, that then you have to figure out why. So, um, you know, Dr. Raftka will tell you in more detail than me, but basically if you add wood ashes or lime to your compost pile, you can turn nitrogen into a gas that will escape. And the whole point of composting is to be able to have nutrients in the compost. You're already adding organic matter to the soil, you're amending it, you're making it uh, able to retain moisture and nutrients and stuff like that. So you don't really wanna lose your, your nutrients. So what could you add to compost? Well, you might not need to add anything, but it kind of depends a little bit too on, on how many different, um, you know, food products or, or different types of waste can you actually use. So realistically, um, green sand is a way to add potassium very, 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 very slowly, but it does have a lot of micronutrients in it. It's like a zero, zero, and then maybe a 0.1, but you can add this to the soil if you want. If you're adding stuff that does not have a lot of, of um, phosphorus, and your soils are deficient in phosphorus, you could add bone meal. Um, and if you had just leaves and nothing else, you could just use leaves and blood meal. You can use leaves as your source of carbon. You can use blood meal as your source of um, nitrogen. And you could put like six inches of leaves, a couple cups of blood meal, six inches of leaves, a couple cups of blood meal and mix it up and you should get some um, decomposition. You, it, you go to the store and you find these compost activators and they say, oh, you've got to add these to your, your compost pile to make them work. And I tell people, if it makes you happy, use them. It's not going to hurt anything at all, but it's kind of a waste of money. Basically, they contain some sort of microorganism. And so this might even, you might get some, um, some uh, decomposition. De de biological decomposition activity that you notice in the near future. And, but mostly it's usually due because they have nitrogen in there. And oftentimes we put a lot of brown stuff in our piles and we don't put enough nitrogen. So everything, again, like that, like that lettuce you found in your refrigerator, everything that you need, everything that in, in the woods, things get decomposed without you adding a compost starter. But again, it does not affect the quality of your compost. It, if it makes you happy, feel free to use it, but you do not have to. So when, when you're making the pile, you do want to start with layers. And again, this is more to give you some sort of sense of proportion than it is necessary for the microbes to do their activity. Somehow you, you might want to moisten your pile, whether it's near a hose, um, you know, if it needs to if you're gonna get rain and rain and rain and rain like we did last year, if you don't have a, a bin that has a cover, you can throw a tarp over it because you don't want that anaerobic decomposition to occur. Um, if it's a small pile, it's easy to hand turn. If it gets a little, a little bit bigger, sometimes people put tubes like underneath the pile. Sometimes people put like a PVC with a lot of um, holes in it in the pile. They can use hardware cloth. This is just a bunch of corn stalks. I mean, anything, because you, the, the, you want the pile to have oxygen in it for the microbes that are not only on the outside of the pile, but the microbes on the inside of the pile to be able to, to breathe. And then turning, again, how often should you do it? You know, if, if you have everything up to snuff, I'll tell you the scientific way. Mostly I tell people when they think about it. You know, you have a big pile like this, you can go in with a pitchfork, it's pretty easy to turn. If you have a smaller pile or you have one of those plastic bins, I recommend getting one of these, these little core aerators at the bottom of it. They have like a little 
wing tip and, and so you put it in and the tip opens up and you pull it out and as you do it you twist it and as you're doing it like that you're able to get some oxygen to the the um, materials that are in there and again if you have all the conditions that your compost pile needs it's going to get up to be 130 140 150 within two or three days now from a scientific point of view and if you are managing a compost pile um, yes, it is true that there has been fires in compost piles. It typically would happen in a municipality in a large compost commercial operation. I do not know of any home composters that have set their piles on fire and there's been any instantaneous combustion. If any of you do know that, please let me know just for my records. So you would mix your materials together. Again, you'd have to have carbon, nitrogen, 25 to 30 to one, moisture, microbes, warm temperatures, water. After just a few days, the temperature would get really high. Then what happens is it comes down. Once it gets down to 100, you would turn it. It's gonna go back up again. And you keep doing this. You monitor the temperature. Once it goes down to 100, you turn it. Once it goes down to 100, you turn it. Then at the end, when you turn it, you should not get any more change in temperature. So why is this? Well, maybe it's done. Maybe if you still can see materials that are recognizable, maybe what happened is that you just ran out of nitrogen or you ran out of moisture. So you have to kind of, you know, um, use a little bit of critical thinking and figure out why this is happening. So uh, again, this is from, this is a great on-farm composting handbook. It used to be about $20 or something along those lines. It's a really great book. It's an investment. It has all these calculations. It has all these charts. So if you do want to have good, if you want to have a hot compost pile, you want the carbon nitrogen ratio to be somewhere between 20 and 40 to one. You'd like there to be 40 to 65 percent moisture. You'd like there to be at least a, a five percent oxygen concentration. And there are there are quick ways for you to determine this, which I'm not going to go into today. You want small particles. You put these big branches in; they're going to decompose, but not in a short period of time. You'd like there to be air spaces in your pile. And this is one of the reasons why you want to use a bunch of different food stocks. Because if you do, some are big, some are small. Sometimes people just put in some wood chips in there because the wood chips are big. And so they give a little bit of aeration. Um, again, there's another way to determine bulk density. And you want it somewhere to be 800 to 1,200 pounds per cubic yard. The pH will be well, depending on the feedstock, somewhere between you know five and nine, but usually when it's finished, it's closer to seven, and, and the temperature should heat up. So these are these are what, you, if according to this book, you're looking for these parameters to be in these ranges. So once it's done, well, as I mentioned, it, it would no longer heat up when you're um, turning it, and you would be able to know that that the individual particles are probably no longer recognizable. And then you want your pile to cure for a while before you use it. So curing, what happens is the, the particles, the, the different types of organic molecules that are in their soil are turning into more stable, maybe humus and other types of compounds, um, anything that's a little bit like some of the, the, the salts might need to be leached out a little tiny bit more. You want to turn it a few times. And so it puts it into like a steady state. It's, it's stable. Its properties won't change or they're stable. And so if you sent your, that, at that point in time, if you wanted to get your, your um, compost tested by the lab, I only know that UMaine and Penn State will do it. I'm sure there's private ones that will do it too. And so what would you find? You would find, this was from someone, I used to work at the UMass um, soil testing lab. And this was a study that my boss had done You'd find the moisture content, you know, somewhere around 50% near neutral pH. Salt should be four or less. If the salts are more than four, do not use that compost on your plants. Maybe you can mix it into a garden and put mature plants in, but it would probably desiccate seedlings. People are kind of surprised. You, and I usually finish, this is, this is a little bit odd because usually finished compost, the organic matter is between 40 and 60%. And people say, well, why is it at 100%? I put in 100% compost. I put uh, materials. I put in leaves and I put in this and I put in that, stuff like that. It's the thing is, 
Think about your log in the fireplace. You put your log in the fireplace and you burn it. And what do you have left over? You have ash, right? Because you have some inorganic components. Even in our, in our bones, we have calcium and stuff like that. Calcium is not considered organic matter. So usually it would be between 40 and 60. Usually the carbon nitrogen ratio would be less than 20. The nitrogen would vary depending upon the feedstocks. The ammonia should be low. And um, um, in this case, uh, we don't know where the compost came from. Um, we live in an old state. About 20% of the soil samples we get in are contaminated with lead. I would not be surprised if there was a little bit of heavy metals in the, the compost. Um, especially if you're using like street leaves or you're getting materials from off of your property. If you got it from your property and you know you didn't live in an old house that had lead paint in it, then you probably would anticipate you would not have any heavy metals in it. But the reason why we don't do compost testing and it's so expensive is all of these, and this isn't even including the NPK and some of the other things, the bulk density and some of the other things they look at, Every single one of these is a different test. It, you take, some of them are quick, some of them take a lot of time, they take different equipment. So we just do not have the ability and we just don't have, we're a tiny little two person lab. We just don't have the time to do it. So just a little bit more, we'll finish up shortly. So your compost pile is not doing anything. Usually it's because it needs water or it needs nitrogen. If you just, especially if it's just a pile of leaves and it's not doing anything, I would, I would see if it was moist, I would add maybe a couple cups of blood meal, or if you had a source of manure or cottonseed meal or corn gluten, or if you don't mind using synthetic fertilizers, some urea and put it in there, mix it all up and see what happens. Um, if it smells from ammonia, there's way too much nitrogenous materials or materials that are high in nitrogen, Again, you would want to cut it. Maybe you could get some mulch hay, or maybe you could get some wood shavings that they use for, for pets, or maybe you could get some, um, I don't know, um, shredded paper or some cardboard um, that wasn't corrugated because corrugated cardboard might contain boron and, and kind of fluff it up, make the carbon nitrogen ratio closer to 25 to 30 to one, and it shouldn't smell. If it really smells like a rotten odor, it's gone anaerobic. There's too much moisture in there. You have too many things like pineapples or cucumbers or whatever. And again, you would mix it up with some carbon. You'd, you'd fluff it up a little bit, let it dry out. You know, I, I mentioned pests. And this is something everybody can deal with. I am not quite sure that if you had a determined bear that you would have a good way to keep bears out of compost. I think some people bury compost, some people do vermicomposting, some people um, make sure they just put only vegetable matter in there and nothing that would have any kind of, of draw for the bear and then they bury it each time. But I know a lot of people in Litchfield County have problems with bears. Um, if you have a really good foolproof solution, um, you, know, they can, you can put an electric fence around there. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's different ways, but I don't know a real good one. And then again, I don't think that you as, as backyard composters are gonna have a problem with high pile temperatures. Um, it's more of a commercial issue. Um, let's say you don't really wanna do a compost thing, but you still want some, some bag compost and you have a lot of leaves. You can, you can get some plastic bags. You could probably do this in a metal garbage can too, which could be cycled. You add a little bit of moisture depending on the leaves, throw in some blood meal or some other source of nitrogen. Um, yeah, in this case, you might want to use a compost activator because you're not going to be exposing this to um, um, nature, although you would put a few holes in the bag so you get some aeration. You could roll these around and you might get some leaf mold by, by spring. I, I have friends that do this. I have not tried it, so I, I'm not sure how successful it would be. Pick composting, again, if you don't want to have a compost pile, you could, you could have a trench, you could put your kitchen waste on there, you could cover it up. And, and, and again, it wouldn't work if you had tons and tons and tons of, of food material waste, but if you have maybe bears and, or, or you have you know, some other critter that's bothering your compost pile and you had a big enough garden, you could do this. Um, and then again, there's worm composting. You get 
what, what the worm ladies used to charge me, $29.99 for one pound of red wigglers, which contains about a thousand worms. And that's about how much you would need to put in, in one of these one of these blue containers. And typically we would use shredded paper and coconut core as a um, medium for them to, to live in. And then you would feed them. You know, I would feed mine like once a week. And then you kind of look and see, is the food gone? Is the food not gone? Some food they don't like, you wouldn't use oranges. Some food like melons, they just devour right away. So you can do composting inside as well. When you're using it, you can work it in the garden. Some people like to screen it, it's up to you. If you screen it and you have bigger chunks, you can just put them back in the compost pile and maybe they won't decompose, but they're gonna to add to aeration. So there's a bunch of things that you can do. This was a field experiment on my part, and I, was, I don't really know why, I was very upset. So I have this part of my vegetable garden, I had like 18 tomato plants, so I have nine on this side, nine on this side. So I, I said, okay, I'm gonna get some compost. And this is compost that we did have chickens at the time. I mix in some compost in the planting holes. I planted my tomatoes. They did really good. You could see all these tomatoes on it. And then they ended up dying. So I'm not quite sure why. I'm not quite sure whether I put too much compost in and it stayed too wet. I'm not quite sure if I got some sort of disease and those variety, because I usually pair them up. So these were like the same variety and these are the same variety and the next one are the same variety. I shouldn't probably do that, but I did. So I don't know why. So my advice is to mix it into the whole soil and not just dump it into the planting. Um, there isn't really a good way for me to tell you what kind of application rate to use. It should be based on your soil test and your condition of the soil. As a general rule of thumb, you would use more of a low nutrient compost like leaf base maybe a little bit more food waste based and then a little a little bit i mean and then a little bit less of manure waste based because if it's a manure based compost it probably has more nutrients so you kind of know need to know a little bit when you're adding this especially on a large scale what you have what what kind of compost you're using and really and truly try not to over apply phosphorus it's the number one inland wet, uh, water pollutant in Connecticut it's an environmental problem and it's found a lot in the um, manure-based compost, it seems more than the food waste-based compost. Um, I'm gonna leave these to, to Dr. Um, Rafka, but sometimes people are concerned about heavy metals. Sometimes they're concerned about, oh, can I put my potato peels in there because they might be genetically, genetically engineered. And also there has been problems, although not as many now, about different herbicides that are persistent. Um, compost. People talk about compost teas. You can either make a compost extract, they call it a watery compost extract. You take some compost, you put it in a, a, a what do you call it, a burlap bag, you put it in a bucket, you let it steep for a little bit, and, um, and then you, you turn it into, you mix it with water so it looks like weak tea. And this is what you're, what you're doing is you're adding a little bit of nutrients. It's a good thing to use oftentimes when you are, are transplanting, this would be an appropriate first place say, to use it, or if you're trying to give your plants a little tiny bit of boost, depending upon what the compost is made of will depend upon how, how potent it is. And on the other hand, we have these aerobically activated compost teas. So you would use a specific amount of compost and water, you would bubble it, uh, you'd use like one of those aquarium, um, whatever you call it, um, <laughs> this is what happens when you when you get old. Those little aquarium pumps that put pump the water in the bubbles in there, the oxygen in there, and this is not to supply nutrients. This is to supply microbes. Um, I haven't really seen. Uh, some people swear by it. Um, I haven't seen um, really proof positive that it it increases the amount of microbes in the soil to a great extent for a long period of time. Because when you think about it. If I have a handful of good garden soil, there's more microbes in that handful than there are people on this planet. So I don't know that necessarily adding a, some more microbes is gonna make a great big deal of difference. But again, it's not gonna hurt. Some people swear by it. And if you wanna use it, that's fine. If it makes you happy. If you're gonna buy ready-made compost, it should be loose. It should spread easily. It should have a dark color. It should not stink. It shouldn't be soggy. You want a nice earthy smell. And then one quick test that you could do at home, basically, is if you want to know the percent organic matter, 
dry some compost like a shovel foam, measure out one pint, weigh it. If it weighs between eight and 12 ounces, it has between 40 and 60% organic matter, and that's right where you want it to be. If it weighs less than eight ounces, it's probably immature. And if it weighs more than 12 ounces, it's either too old compost or it's been diluted with some kind of soil or something. So that's what I have for today. And I just like this, you know, compost because a rind is a terrible thing to waste. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'll be available for questions. Great, Don. Thank you so much. Um, you have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, and Don actually has to leave at 4.30. So Dr. Rafka has answered some of the questions in the chat um, to help us with that time constraint. Uh, but can you see them? Actually, I have one question that came in to me very early on um, that uh, you won't be able to see because it came in to me directly. And that is, can Dawn break down the steps in the food chain where food waste, food is wasted and the percentage of each of the total loss? I'm not sure if you know that since it's uh, a little, you know, it's kind of before the compost steps, but. Right, you know? I, think, I, I, I think that the deep site actually has a lot of information on there about that, plus a few others as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have, I'm at home and I don't have access to my files. Um, and I've just kind of taken this from the government site. So whether it's the Connecticut government site or it's the EPA site, so mm -hmm. they would probably have more specifics. That I don't, unfortunately. That's I'm sure okay. I could probably Thank find them. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Cheryl is gonna look for some links. So she may have put that at okay. the bottom of the chat. Uh, let's see here. Um, do you want me to read questions or do you want to scroll down? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing some of them. I'm up to, um, what do you call it, about oak leaves. You know, yeah. again, any leaves, well, well, maple leaves probably not because they're small and they're, because of the nature, they have a tendency to decompose fast. But beech leaves, oak leaves, you know, any of the leaves that are kind of tough because they have a lot of tannins and stuff like that, if you could shred them, it would be good. If you can't, you're just gonna have to wait. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I don't know that I would, what do you call it, spend my time. I, I don't know how much time people have that they really wanna chop them up. Another idea is to put them in a pile and if they don't have a leaf shredder, just run them over with the lawnmower a few times. So that would be really good. Um, newspapers don't seem to be, what do you call it? Um, I, I do, I have a cockatoo. If anybody wants a cockatoo, please let me know. And I've been adding his newspapers every single day that I change his cage to the compost and the finished compost is still seven. So again, I think that if you use a variety of materials, it doesn't matter if something's acid and something's not. Don't use wood stove ashes. Don't use, Bob will explain and uh, Dr. Rafka will explain in more detail why you should not use ashes, um, but you can use, ashes to as a liming um, like on your lawn you can spread it thinly out over your lawn or you can put it in the vegetable garden if you need to raise the ph it's just that you would want to rinse it off the blades of grass and not put it on the vegetables because um, they they used to use the ashes to make soap back in the colonial days because it contains lye so how often to turn your pile whenever you have time <laughs> you know is what i tell people but again if you have a hot pile you can monitor the temperature and turn it when it's like goes down to 100 degrees. Otherwise, every you add a few buckets of waste, you add a few buckets of, of carbonaceous material and you flip it over. And so usually like a couple of times a month, I mean, you know, it, it really depends on your schedule, it really depends on your schedule. So I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Someone else had, um, Potatoes, yeah. I was gonna say potatoes, potato scab, you can still eat the potatoes, they just don't store well, or you can pick varieties that are scab resistant. And let's see what else. Um, I don't really think, and 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 maybe Dr. Rafa could has some suggestions for this. I don't think that the potatoes you get in the store, I think that the way they treat them, unless maybe they're organic, would not have any diseases in them. And then they put that anti-sprouting spray over it anyways. So I think it would deep 
composed, but I don't think you're going to get potato scab from potatoes that you buy in the store. <laughs> I mean, I really truly don't. Uh, what, let's see. Even in the winter months, we shovel a path out to the compost pile and we dump stuff in. And that's why we have a three bin pile and we have a, a roof, a corrugated roof over it. And we dump it in and we put a few leaves on top so the, it doesn't attract the pest. And, you know, we don't really have that many pests. What else? Yeah. Yes, I have heard about Monique. I did, I did look at her website and when I looked at it a few weeks ago, it was, she was out of worms. <laughs> you know, so what else? Oh, pig, pigs, turkeys, goats, and you know, I do not know what the carbon nitrogen ratio would be. I would go to one of those calculators and try to figure out proportionately which, um, how much of each you have, and plug them in there, and they will give you the carbon nitrogen ratio. I suspect it's probably going to be somewhere about twenty to one, but I don't know for sure. What else? Um, they, people have done a really good job answering a lot of the questions. I, um, the charred wood, it's not really a source of carbon as much as it's a source of biochar. And we're gonna have a speaker next week that's gonna be talking about biochar. So you could put it in your, your, your compost pile. It's probably not gonna decompose unless you chop it up into little teeny pieces. And maybe you don't want it to decompose either because it has a lot of properties that can positively influence the, the soil. So um, I, I do believe compost is effective against crop diseases, but I think that you have to, what do you call it? You're gonna have to, it depends on the disease. Go to the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station's website and look at some of the readings that Abigail Maynard did. I think that would be my, my go-to. Um, I think that's it. I think that's it for me. There was one other one, Don, that you will know the answer to uh, better than anyone. And that is, um, will you be offering the Master Composter class again soon? Oh, I'm gonna try to meet with, with my, co-host Gail in the next two weeks and we're going to hopefully do it late summer or po probably September. Anybody who's interested, please email me. I only let in 24 people because the problem is I can only I could I can only be a volunteer coordinator for that many people. I don't I only pay Gail to work five hours a week. She's a master gardener coordinator. So almost all the activities I have to coordinate, and it's a lot of work if any of you do coordinate volunteers. I have great, great volunteers. And if you're interested, email me. I'll put you on my email list. And as soon as I update the flyer, I'll send it out to everybody. How does that sound? <laughs> great, John. Thank you. I'll put your be, email in the chat. I was going to say, it'll be, it'll be in the soil lab and the ladybug email, I mean, I mean, website, but right now they're updating and they're move, migrating the website. So I'm not sure that everything's on it, but if they just email me directly, I'll put you on my list. And I'm the one that sends the list out. There are a few questions at the bottom. Um, I see one from Kara um, that says, I assume composting kills any insect cocoons. So are you leaving some leaves for them to overwinter and others that you compost? Uh, yeah, yeah, nobody can rake up all the leaves in their yard. And there's a the woods all around us. <laughs> you know? So, so and the thing too is like, with, if it's, if it's the, the cocoons would only die if you got the compost temperature up high, which is really hard to do over the winter time. So I suspect a lot of things overwinter in the compost. <laughs> you know? including the eggs of those stupid worm, uh, dumping worms. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that we can um, say thank you to you once again, Don, for your lovely presentation. Um, and if more questions come in, we can try to um, loop folks in with responses um, yeah. if Dr. Rafka can't address them later. Um, right, you, you can email so me and I can get back to it. The, 
All right. Well, listen, you guys take care. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll talk to you later. All right. I'm going to take off. All right, We're going to take a quick break now. Um, I actually think we're going to do a So do I just go? Do you have a okay. I'll say welcome back to folks. Um, okay. I hope you had uh, enough time to have a quick stretch and, and maybe get a cat to visit you. Um, and uh, we're going to start the next part of the webinar series with Dr. Ravka. So go ahead. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, Dawn definitely covered a lot of very interesting topics. And you may see a slightly different take on my end. Please don't think that, that, that there's just one opinion on composting. There's actually quite a few. Um, I may present things slightly differently, uh, but know that, that uh, I present for Dawn every time we do the, the Master Composter series. So like I say, you'll see some slightly different takes on this. Uh, and know that I am from uh, the University of Rhode Island. So, you know, again, slightly different take on things. So here we go. Um, I like to start with a couple of quotes because it's, it sort of helps set the mood. Um, this is a particularly old one, um, that the earth neither grows old nor wears out if it is dunged. You don't often hear the word dung, dunged in conversation. I would like to play that in Scrabble sometime um, and be challenged. Um, a more modern one is that compost is, is definitely a glorious refutation of the idea of garbage in, garbage out. Far from it. <clears throat> the carts on the right-hand side are uh, a typical year's production from, from our house. Um, and that's quite a bit of compost. And it's, it's all, in, in this case, uh, vermicompost. And we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. The thing that I sort of get bent out of shape about is that, you know, composting is definitely an old practice. Um, and there are any number of well-meaning individuals who are out there in any sort of version of that, that phrase um, that espouse any number of non-scientific theories about compost and its preparation. And to hear them tell it, composting is something that borders on the magical. Um, it isn't. Composting is chemistry, specifically organic chemistry. And in the parlance of a chemist, we would say that it's a set of heterogeneous, exothermic biochemical reactions that create smaller, simpler molecules from larger, more complex ones. I'll go into all of that. Um, I'll break that down for you. Some molecules remain intact. We'll find out things like indole-3-acetic acid um, that's naturally uh, found as a rooting hormone in plants. It survives as do any number of other compounds. But other compounds, in fact, can become more toxic um, along the way. We'll, we'll, we'll hear the story of 2,4-dichlorophenol and how it is a breakdown product of 2,4-D. And definitely know that the chemical science associated with composting is still very much evolving. The structure I have up top of fulvic acid, which is one of the simpler humic acids, may not even be correct. So uh, we have a lot to learn, especially with regard to the chemistry. In terms of the topics for this evening, I'll go over uh, a number of the topics that Dawn did in the first part of this talk. It'll be about a third of the talk, uh, how things break down, the overall process, uh, dilution effects, pathways to humus, the value of humus, and then ultimately how to preserve it. And along the way, uh, I will include lots of photomicrographs. I love um, to take pictures through my microscopes. And if you had seen a video of this particular one, the kind of coppery looking uh, thing Please. in the upper right um, is, uh, is actually something that was running around in there. It was some sort of little critter. Um, it would actually be really cool to see that as a video. But in any case, after that, we'll talk in some detail about choosing organic raws uh, and some raws to very carefully consider uh, I have a new section that I'm going to be trying out today for the first time on some work that I've done on microplastics and compost. How to know when compost is finished, 
testing and, and ultimately the limits of testing, uh, a, a quick slide of um, some sources that you should you should take a look at when you get a chance, and then hopefully some time for some questions and answers as well. So if you've ever seen sort of a prison movie from maybe the 50s or 60s, you see the inmates out on the pile of rocks making big ones from little ones. Um, I'm sorry, little ones from big ones. That would that would not work. Uh, little ones from, from big ones. Um, composting, for the most part, converts complex macromolecules into smaller, simpler chemical entities. And again, remember, this is a heterogeneous reaction. A lot of times chemists run reactions in one phase. Everything is, for example, in the liquid phase. This is a solid phase. It's a liquid phase. There's a gaseous phase as well. Um, but know that any type of composting is accelerated by agitation. Don talked about that in terms of turning or stirring. Increasing the temperature definitely uh, facilitates the breakdown of molecules. Increasing the concentration, not necessarily having a lot of, for example, soil in the composter, which just sort of slows things down. And reducing the particle size, knowing that uh, sawdust is going to rot faster than a, a tree stump. Within the composter, and by the way, this picture in the upper right is my main worm composter, and there's a bucket, a stainless bucket ready to be dumped in for, for feeding them. Um, organic matter is transformed by a diverse community, not just the worms of both macro and microorganisms. And you see the worms in the bottom right. Uh, that's when I've sort of stirred off the top of the pile. And then the finished product uh, in terms of the, the compost. Compost, as Dawn said, can be created from any number of organic raw materials. And as I say, in the second part of this talk, we'll really talk about some choices uh, associated with that. The key thing is, is that I always say you should think about your selections that would go into a composter as you would your selections from a buffet line or a salad bar. Don't just load up on the things that you like, um, you know, just the shrimp or the roast beef or whatever. Try to incorporate multiple streams into a composter because in doing so, you're not, so to speak, putting all your eggs in one basket. You, you minimize uh, risks and you balance added nutrients. So diverse uh, streams are definitely better. This is an old chemistry aphorism that probably would get me in trouble at an American Chemical Society national meeting uh, nowadays, but, but in the 50s and probably in the very early 60s, it was often said that the solution to pollution is dilution. Now, we know that's not true, things bioaccumulate. But there is a certain small truth in, in this as it applies to the home composter, and we'll talk about this in just a second. When you look at a single source compost, if you literally just composted one thing, you'd probably get yourself in a fair bit of trouble. Um, for example, if you live near the beach and you had, uh, for example, access to eelgrass or kelp that was high on the beach, um, you could break it down, you could shred it up, you could make it into compost, but, but even if it was washed off reasonably well, there would be excessive levels of plain old salt, sodium chloride in that material, and it probably wouldn't be that useful. Compost made exclusively from grass clippings, again, depending on the source, could contain undesirable proportions of herbicide or, or, herbicide, or, herbicide or pesticide residues, and just simply put, working with, if you've ever done it, working with a lot of grass clippings, they get hot, they get smelly, they turn kind of a nasty looking white. Um, grass clippings are not a lot of fun to work with. If you live, for example, near a poultry farm, hopefully on the upwind side, uh, poultry manure alone would be very, very high in soluble salts. There is the possibility of making compost exclusively from fallen leaves, and we'll talk more about this as we go on. But the decay is slow unless the particle size is reduced. And ultimately, you have to augment or you know, significantly increase nitrogen levels if they're going to rot in a decent amount of time. So by the way, this picture is my composter after Halloween. All of the pumpkins that we carved and whatever got kind of chopped up for the worms and thrown in. The top will go back on later. Um, but when we consider the chemical comp uh, composition of organic matter, we're talking about plant materials, animal waste, nitrogen containing materials, carbohydrate polymers in the form of polysaccharides, lipids, 
small quantities, fats and oils, and ultimately proteins. And additional components include inorganic materials and lignin. We won't cover inorganic materials too much, but we will talk a little bit about lignin a little bit later on. So in terms of nitrogenous waste, uh, in mammalian systems, um, we produce urea and uric acid. Uh, in otherwise unavailable forms to the plants. If you were to simply put these in a sterile medium uh, in, in, on, a, on a plant, it wouldn't do anything. The plant doesn't know what to do with them. But in the presence of microflora, these organic forms, and you can see urea in the bottom left and then just to the right of that uric acid, these are broken down by microorganisms to produce the inorganic forms, ammonium and H4 plus, and nitrate, NO3 minus. And this was actually touched upon in the last uh, talk. There is uh, this emerging body of, of work that would suggest that biochar, which is essentially finely powdered charcoal, not ashes, but charcoal, the black stuff, um, may actually be mixed with organic raws to the tune of about maybe one to 2% by weight. Um, and it, studies have shown, some of them from China, some of them from this country, have suggested that piles will attain higher peak temperatures while reducing the production of NOx, of, of nitrogen-containing gases, much like NOx would be uh, the equivalent of, of, for example, exhaust fumes from a car, nitrogen oxides in, in various uh, chemical species within that classification. Uh, and again, if you're producing less nitrogen emissions, you're also retaining more in the compost. So it's actually nicer stuff. And this picture in the bottom right is by scanning electron microscopy. And the way I think about it, I'm a chemist, I'm not a, a biologist, but these are essentially like little condos for bacteria. They, they give uh, a good habitat for the critters that, that are doing the heavy lifting in the pile. As far as polysaccharides go, a lot of plant material is, is both starch and cellulose. These are shortened and debranched by enzymes. So if you look at that structure of cellulose, the repeating structure in the center might be say 50 or even 500, 5,000 repeating units. And the enzymes are basically breaking down, debranching, um, shortening, it essentially to oligosaccharides, which are shorter chain lengths or even down to monosaccharides. And the structure on the bottom is starch. Uh, this, is, this is again, a, a alpha 1,4 linkage versus cellulose, which is a beta 1,4. And I put in a little photo inset of cornstarch. Cornstarch is very interesting under the microscope because it has a Maltese cross pattern. You can never miss uh, cornstarch under a microscope under cross polarizing light. It has this very, very characteristic look which I think is very cool. My students think it's, it's really cool as well. As far as lipids go, there are some traces of fats that you're going to pick up, not necessarily pouring used oil, and that's certainly not a good idea, uh, but there are traces of fats and oils, and they are hydrolyzed to form free fatty acids, uh, so we have a glycerol backbone. Uh, it's often said that when fatty materials go into a composter, the smell can be quite unpleasant, because of low molecular weight free fatty acids, which smell really, really bad. So please keep fats and oils um, out of the composter. As far as proteins go, uh, proteins are polypeptides, very, very long chains. Uh, and these are hydrolyzed to produce either uh, shorto, shorter uh, chain lengths or ultimately down to free amino acids. And for those of you who remember high school or college chem, there are 20 common amino acids, which um, I've just put in there for fun. This next slide is uh, probably a work in progress of some sort. Uh, lignin is found in plant materials, particularly in wood. It's a polyphenolic species. It's, it's associated with the structure of, of wood, gives, gives the strength of the tree. And through a series of additions and cleavage reactions, lignin can produce humic acid, and this is a structure here that I've shown. What seems to be emerging, to the literature would suggest that this structure is actually not correct. And in fact, all around the periphery, there are sugar molecules. Nature comes with a sugar coating. And the only reason we see humic acid in this form is that through the alkaline extraction process, 
to try and isolate this material, we cleave all the sugars on the periphery of the molecule. So in fact, although this structure is periodically updated, probably we have a big update coming along where in fact now this, this molecule, this backbone is covered in, in all kinds of sugar residues. When composting is, is, is being carried out, we're trying to produce humus. And when we look at compost from just a strictly fertilizer perspective, it's a low potency fertilizer. If you look at typical analyses of compost, nitrogen levels are in the range of about 1%, uh, maybe as low as 0.75% or as much as two and a half, depending on what you're composting. But Compost really earns its keep because it's a spectacular soil amendment and conditioner because of the stuff called humus. And the photomicrograph on the left is what my soil in the backyard in Stonington looks like. If it looks like beach sand, it's not far off. It's pretty poor stuff. Uh, I don't live that far from the coast. So again, it's sandy stuff. But when you look at the, the, the picture on the right, this is leaf mold. This is just composted leaves and again, uh, there's a critter in the upper right-hand corner there that was running around when I, when I took its picture. Um, this doesn't dry out in the summer. This doesn't dry up and blow away. This stays dark, it retains moisture. And as we'll see, it also retains chemical nutrients, which is really, really important. So to categorize compost, to break it down, um, compost contains living organisms, which I'll touch on a little bit, organic matter, and then inorganic components, which we really won't talk about. They're kind of a diluent. Organic matter can be broken into humus, which we'll break down a little bit further, and then unaltered material. Unaltered material is dead, but you can still see what it was. So it's the, the, the stem from your Halloween pumpkin, it's tomato skins, it's any number of things that are definitely dead, but they haven't really broken down that much. Humus is composed of two very distinct chemical classes. Um, humic substances, and again, here's a model structure on the right of fulvic acid, um, are these polyphenolic species, uh, and again, maybe, maybe just really part of the skeleton of them, they're not, they're not the whole structure, but then there are non-humic substances, so when fats break down, when carbohydrates break down, when proteins break down, these are all things that are also in the soil, and if you've ever heard the expression, feed the soil, feed the plant, this is really what we're talking about. So in terms of the benefits of humus, and by the way, the picture on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, is a uh, compost that's drying, getting ready to be sieved. Um, it's out on the paved portion of my driveway. That humus will improve the physical, chemical, and biological properties of any soil, but especially what passes for soil here in Southern New England. And again, my soil on the right, not pretty. So in terms of the physical uh, properties, Dawn alluded to this in her talk. The organic substances, the organic materials in humus can bind with the primary soil particles, sand, silt, and clay, to form aggregate particles called PEDs. PEDs are good. PEDs give structure to the soil. They prevent it from blowing away when it's windy, from washing away when it's particularly rainy, and they allow better root penetration. So regardless of the texture of the soil, regardless of the percentages of sand, silt, and clay, compost can help structure that soil. This is a model structure of humic acid. And again, perhaps not the full structure. Maybe we, we need to throw in some sugars, but I've color coded it. Uh, the red groups are carboxylic acids. The pink groups are unbound phenolic hydroxyls. And if you don't remember the structure, if you don't remember what this is about, just keep this in mind. The humic acids in related species have a negative charge. Opposites attract. So this molecule has the ability to hold on to positively charged soil nutrients. Things like potassium, calcium, magnesium, ammonium, all of these stick to this molecule in your soil until the plant wants them, until it basically plucks it away to get it into the root. So instead of sort of put and take, if you will, 
especially on a sandy soil like I have, this holds nutrients in the soil until the plant is ready to take them up. You don't have to worry that when it rains, everything washes down to your neighbor's house or your neighbor's yard. So the key thing is, is that because of this electrical attraction, components of, of compost allow you not so much to even fertilize your soil as to keep the fertilizer in place. And finally, in terms of the biological properties, um, as I said before, when you have these breakdown products of the fats, the carbohydrates, the nitrogenous materials, you're adding carbon, you're adding nitrogen, you're adding phosphorus that will facilitate both plant and microbiological growth, feed the, feed the soil, feed the plant. But there are other components as well. And I had alluded to this at the outset. Indole 3 acetic acid is a natural rooting hormone. If you've ever used a rooting hormone, there's a synthetic equivalent that's a naphthal acetic acid. But that material is known to survive the composting process. So the naturally occurring rooting hormone that's in plants can basically be recycled for the next generation of plants. The structure on the right is gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid is known to uh, be a plant growth modulator. And again, this compound survives. So when compost is put down, you are literally giving plants the benefit of previous generations of plants. And this actually, I was kind of laughing when I saw this, the, the slide that Don put up. Um, I do use compost around my tomato plants. I put a little bit underneath, not a lot. And then I top dress with compost as well. And I have not had any significant issues with it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what goes in my compost in just a minute. In terms of cultural practices, you've worked so hard to make this beautiful compost. The humic acids probably are going to outlive us all. They have a very, very long lifespan in soil. Uh, and they're considered to be a stable form of carbon. But the non-humic portion is not. Those broken down carbohydrates and fats and amino acids can decompose if we encourage highly aerobic conditions, essentially whipping the garden to a froth with a rototiller, um, using high nitrogen soluble fertilizers, essentially these materials are broken down uh, and to carbon dioxide and that returns to the atmosphere never to return to your soil. So increased fertility now could be lost later on. So if there is a message, some tilling, sure. Beginning in the end of the season, I do it. But I don't do it anything more than I have to. And I try my best at the beginning of the season, sure, the plants get some soluble fertilizer, but after that, they're kind of on their own. Um, I don't do too much for them otherwise. So. This is the second portion of the talk, and I think a, a portion that generates a lot of questions. I've, I've been a master gardener at the University of Rhode Island for, I think, 22 years now, 22 or 23 years. And what you see is that when people come in, they have lots and lots of questions about what should go into a pile and even how much of it. So we'll talk about manure, we'll talk about weeds, we'll talk about grass clippings and some other things as well. Um, and I'll try to explain my rationale for why I would either definitely put it in, definitely not put it in, or at least consider um, the, the choice. So this is sort of the master list. Uh, the ones with the asterisks I'll kind of address at the outset, and then there are the ones without are, are those that I'll go into more detail on. Um, Don talked about sawdust. And one of the things about sawdust is that whether it's hardwood or softwood, it's fine. It doesn't much matter but it is the painted wood, it is the treated wood, it is the wood composites. If you see the structure on the right, it's triclosan. That is put in as an antimicrobial in wood composites. That does not break down very well in the composter. And it does have some tremendously um, significant biological effects. That's gonna definitely alter the, the microflora in the pile. Newspaper in terms of uh, just regular old gray, you know, black ink on, on newsprint is probably okay. It's not particularly, you know, nutritious. It's a source of cellulose. It's a high carbon material. I would definitely not use anything that was, that was glossy or colored. Um, I, would, I would try to avoid that. I do put in cooked meat scraps into my pile. I have a tight fitting cover. Um, and if I make a chicken for dinner on a Sunday, 
we eat the chicken, we boil up the carcass for stock and the defatted, deboned material I do put in and I cover it. Uh, it's done in the winter months so there isn't really any smell and the worms absolutely adore it. Um, eggshells, which is calcium carbonate in the protonaceous matrix. A little, yeah, uh, I run them through the blender uh, to try and reduce the particle size. And it is known that worm slime is actually very high in calcium. So a little bit of calcium is not a bad thing, but we'll find out that you can definitely overdo a good thing. Bones do not break down in the composter. Um, they are, chemically speaking, uh, tricalcium phosphate mostly is the mineral component. Um, in a, again, in a protein matrix, they break down very, very slowly. I made a, a bone crucible that I take the bones from the chicken or whatever we ate, throw it in the crucible, put it in the wood stove at the end of the night. And now I have wood ash, which is uh, a purified form. And although it lacks the nitrogen, the raccoons don't come after it. And alliums, my leeks, my garlic, onions, absolutely love both the calcium and the phosphorus in tricalcium phosphate that I make. These other, uh, items here I'll go into in, in, in some detail on the subsequent slides. Um, the picture up top, I, I took this picture, uh, the last time I presented for Dawn, I did it as kind of a joke. Um, I found a pineapple on the side of the road, um, must have fallen out of the back of somebody's car or something, and, and I brought it home and my wife was like, why are you doing this? And I said, oh, I, I, I basically insulated the pile, I threw the pineapple in, and I'll let the worms think they've, they've gone on vacation to Hawaii. We'll try to, try to fake them out. I'm not sure if they were buying, but every now and again, they do get a treat of something unusual. Um, in terms of kitchen scraps, whenever available, we keep a stainless bucket underneath the sink and my worms absolutely adore kitchen scraps. They get fed and I would argue overfed in August and September when side streams from our canning are everywhere. We have the pomace from the tomatoes and whatever else. Um, I do put in small amounts of dairy products and cooked meat scraps that I alluded to before in the colder months. Uh, and I have found when you put it on top, you kind of know what the worms like. It's gone the next morning. Uh, but citrus waste, and you see the picture on the left, we had made some, some homemade lemonade are definitely rock bottom on my list of worms favorite foods. And the answer came out a few years ago that limonene is present in citrus peels and it's incredibly toxic to worms. A worm won't go near it. Uh, it knows it will, it will kill it. But yet when a, a peel goes kind of the, with the, the bluish mold, the penicillium mold that infects the, the peel, all of a sudden the worms will, will eat it like anything else. And in fact, studies have shown that the limonene is the first thing to go when the penicillium mold uh, infects the, 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 the peel. So if I had to eat a peel, I would prefer it not have the mold, but I'm not a worm. The worms like them when they go moldy. And once they do, they eat them like everything else. In terms of leaves, um, I have a lot of trees on my property. Um, they're, they're good. I don't have to, to spend money on gas. When you compost leaves, you get very few weed seeds, unlike manure, which we'll talk about in a minute. But trees ultimately are smart. Um, they don't leave anything behind in a leaf that they can't get out. So the nutritive value of leaves is very, very low. My worms don't particularly care for them um, because they know that there is really that much nutritive value. I do use leaves for insulating my pile in the winter and I'll do that around Thanksgiving time. And then they become the base for the new pile in May. Once I take everything out, I'll make a base of the leaves. And again, most of my leaves get cycled through temporary composters. You can see this picture on the bottom. I take black plastic bags, uh, make some weeper holes, uh, fill the bags up with uh, leaves. And then usually I wet them with a, a high nitrogen, some, some sort of cheap fertilizer. And through the course of the winter, they break down completely no, but enough that I can turn them in in the, in the spring. And it's not bad. Is it perfect? No. But it, again, as Don said, you never have too much compost. Oak leaves came up in the last talk, and I want to just touch on them again. Uh, whenever I work a master gardener kiosk, oak leaves are a question we always get. And why do they break down so slowly? Will they make my compost really acidic? What's the best use for them? 
the waxy cuticle, the, the, the water resistant cuticle on an oak leaf is made of a chemical compound called quercetin. It repels water and it can uh, hinder breakdown. Shredding definitely helps. And the, the finer you can make them, if you can run over them with a, the lawnmower or whatever, the better. The tannins that they contain, the polyphenolic species, will degrade over time and generally speaking, won't have a significant effect on the finished uh, compost. The pH is not gonna be significantly different than if you used other leaves or other materials in general. At the end of the season, when we've had a killing frost, I gather up all my tomato and pepper plants with whatever is stuck to them. And I run over them in the driveway with an old lawnmower. And I chop them to essentially a green brown mush that I shovel into the worm pile. And insofar as I know, the worms have not complained. This is just a good way of reducing particle size and ultimately bulking up the pile for the winter. One of the questions from the last talk was, how do you keep a pile warm in the winter? Size matters. So if you have a larger pile, it will lose heat less readily than a smaller pile with a higher ratio of surface area to volume. So this stuff probably doesn't look too appealing to, to us, but to the worms, this is pretty good. And it gets them quite a ways into the winter. Weeds, when I pick weeds in the, in the course of the summer, they just get thrown in. And you can see I have some volunteer tomatoes growing around the, the composter in the summer. Um, plant pathogens, because it is a cool pile, are also likely to survive. And as I wrote as one of the comments in the last one, a lot of plant pathogens are simply endemic. Um, early blight, you can do everything you want to control it, but it's really up to the weather. If it's a cool, damp summer, you're going to have early blight. And even if you isolate everything that had early blight on it, you're not going to eliminate it. Um, I definitely would not compost noxious weeds. So for example, and don't please don't try this, but the idea that poison ivy could be broken down, but the erushiol, the active ingredient in comp, uh, in, in uh, poison ivy would definitely survive. And I would not want to touch that compost. So definitely noxious weeds, no, but your run of the mill weeds, preferably before they've gone to seed are perfectly fine. In terms of grass clippings, I talked a little bit about the physical challenges before. Uh, we do bag clippings from around our pool. We have an in-ground pool, so you don't want to clog up the filter. I tend to dry them on top of the composter, if you saw that top. Um, and as Dawn suggested with soil, whenever I put down a bucket of, of uh, raw materials, the, the stuff from under the kitchen sink, um, I put dried grass clippings on top and it provides sort of a physical barrier to keep the flies off of them. And again, I don't use any herbicides or pesticides, Although if a neighbor happened to have some uh, clippings and I knew that there weren't pets or, or um, herbicides or pesticides used, I'd probably use a few more. Um, but again, I don't generate a lot of grass clippings. The problem with treated grass clippings is the possibility of herbicide or pesticide residues. And I choose one as kind of a case study. 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid, 2,4-D, is a very, very common herbicide for controlling broadleaf uh, weeds and lawns. It has a variable half-life in soil, about six weeks in acid soils like ours, could be shorter in other soils, but basically it breaks down in a fairly orderly fashion. And the acute toxicity, the LD50 is low. I'll explain this on the next slide. Um, 639 milligrams per kilo, which is not particularly toxic, but, the initial decomposition step takes the compound on the far left, 2,4-D, and makes glycolic acid, which is related to acetic acid. It's, it's nothing to consider to concern yourself with, but also 2,4-dichlorophenol. This is the primary breakdown product of 2,4-D. And now you look at its uh, MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet. Now the LD50 is 47 milligrams per kilo. 14 times more toxic than the parent. In chronic exposure to mice, it's a carcinogen. In chronic exposure to rats and mice, it's a teratogen. It produces birth defects. And in chronic exposure to rats, mice, and hamsters, it's a mutagen. It causes genetic abnormalities. So this is now a situation where you had a compound that was there that was moderately toxic and now is significantly more so. And to put that into perspective, 
Imagine a group of 10 rats that weigh what I do. We're talking about a 191 pound rat, which is pretty scary. Each rat receives 4.12 grams or 47 milligrams per kilo of body weight of 2,4 dichlorophenol in his Purina rat chow. And yes, there is such a product. 10 take a nap and five don't wake up. And if you're wondering what 4.12 grams looks like, a nickel weighs five grams. So this suddenly is now not nearly as benign as it was. Composting can make more toxic things out of less toxic ones. So again, as we'll see at the end, good choices matter. In terms of manure, we get a lot of questions about that as well. Um, I used to, uh, I, I've never owned a truck. And so transporting manure in my wife's car got it significantly smelly and dirty. That's kind of a classic joke. You know, how do you keep your car clean when you're transporting manure? You use your spouse's car. Um, it definitely contains lots of interesting weed seeds. And I'm definitely more concerned about pathogens than I once was. Uh, I used to give fresh manure to the worms in winter to kind of give them a treat, but I've actually gone to a, a slightly different path and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, this is my daughter in the back of my wife's car. In terms of the, the concerns associated with herbivore manure, uh, residual worming compound can be an issue. If the horses that produce the manure just got wormed, that anti-worming compound, the, the parental panel weight, is going to do a number on my worms and I'm going to wipe out the pile. There have been reports of high levels of copper sulfate in commercially composted manure, and it was eventually traced back to the idea that you see the cow walking through the hoof bath. These contain copper sulfate to treat the, the cow's hooves, but in fact, when it gets so full of just about everything else, uh, people have taken the, the bath and just thrown it on the manure pile and then put fresh copper sulfate in, well, that copper doesn't go away. And copper sulfate can be an issue in commercial cow manure. As I said before, pathogenic bacteria, um, there's no question that, that manure can be loaded. And I'll talk about the URI considerations in just a second. And ultimately antibiotic residues, things like teramycin, which used, are used a lot in uh, agricultural uh, environments, um, they don't break down particularly well. So, so we have to be concerned with not only things that are, that are pathogenic, but antibiotics that are also there. These are the URI guidelines for manure, and I will share them with you now. Um, composting manure is considered risky if high temperatures aren't hit, so 160 to 170. Uh, you can definitely create good compost without manure and still be you know, safe and beneficial. Uh, the URI recommendation is not to apply raw or aged manure to edible crops, um, if at all possible. If manure is added to the composter, keep it uh, apart from edible crops. Uh, try to apply finished compost in the fall before the ground freezes, so there will be a certain amount of solarization of the, of the material uh, as a way of reducing the bacterial load, and definitely wash your hands with soap and water after handling. If there is sort of a questionable compost in terms of manure content, and you're not sure if high temperatures were achieved, definitely incorporate it into the soil, work it in, get it away from the surface, and then avoid harvesting crops where the edible portion uh, touches the ground, such as leafy greens, for 120 days after application, or even up to 90 days if the edible portion is above the ground, for example, corn. So the URI recommendations are pretty stringent and, again, designed to keep um, bacteria out of your food. This came up in the first talk as well, and I want to touch on the chemistry associated with it now. <clears throat> Limestone is calcitic calcium carbonate, CaCO3. It's the same stuff as in eggshells and seashells, uh, and again, in those cases, in a protein-based matrix. But know that compost develops at a slightly acidic pH. It'll be up, it'll be down, it'll be all over. We'll see this toward the end of the talk but it proceeds through the NH4 or ammonium intermediate on the way to the final nitrate form. If we increase the alkalinity of the pile, if we raise the pH above neutrality, now this form is converted to ammonia, NH3, and it's lost as volatile uh, ammonia. It's not coming back. 
Is it going to make the compost toxic? No, but it's not going to have the same amount of nitrogen as it should. And according to the Cornell website, and I quote, adding lime, calcium carbonate, is generally not recommended because it causes ammonium nitrogen to be lost to the atmosphere as ammonia gas. Not only does it cause odors, it depletes nitrogen that is better kept in the compost for future use for the plants. So although you will lime your soil, probably if, if you live in Connecticut, and you're going to add compost, just don't do them at the same time. Um, space out your compost and liming, um, and your soil will definitely be the better for it. Wood ashes are worse. Wood ashes are finer, um, much, much finer than the, the, the limestone that we buy at the, a big box store. They have a uh, a higher ratio of surface area to volume than limestone, and they're more alkaline. Potassium carbonate, which is about 25% of wood ashes, will hit a pH of 11.6. And remember, it's a logarithmic scale, so it's, it's a, a 10 times more each time you go up by one unit. This is a lot more alkaline or basic than just calcium carbonate. And I have actually been in people's backyards where they've dumped wood ashes on a pile and it smells like somebody dropped a bottle of cleaning ammonia. The smell of, of ammonia is absolutely um, amazing. In terms of allelopathic materials, um, do they get added? Yes. Do they get added a lot? No. So we'll talk about things like black walnut leaves, sunflower seed hulls, and coffee grounds, which are now my worm's favorite food in the winter. So. Black walnut trees, as well as other uh, related species from the walnut family, all produce the compound on the right. Uh, this is called juglum. And these include hickories and pecans as well. I have some native hickories on the front of my property. Um, sunflowers and Jerusalem artichokes produce a chemical class called anuionones in the kind of a model structure is down below. Um, also allelopathic. Coffee. Uh, produces 1,3,7-trimethylxanthine in the seed pods, you know it is caffeine. And all of these agents are allelopathic. These are secondary metabolites produced by the plant, not associated with growth, development, or reproduction. Why do they make them? Because ultimately a plant can't move. Once your roots are in the ground, you're, you're pretty much stuck there. If we wanna compete as a plant for light, for water, for nutrition, it's better to kill off the competition. And allelopathic agents do that. They will either hinder or kill competing species. They create a kill zone around themselves. If you drink a cup of coffee in the morning, I know exactly what your liver is going to do with it. About 84% is gonna to go to pyrazanthine, uh, 12% to theobromine, which is actually found in tea, 4% uh, to theophylline, which is also found in tea. So in your liver, we know exactly what the caffeine is going to do. But in the composter, we don't know. The effects on the community of macro and microorganisms is unknown. Insert your guess here. We, we don't know about jublone or anuionone yet. Again, these studies have not yet been done. But it does say this, and it goes back to the point I made kind of sheepishly before. Higher temperatures, time, and ultimately dilution will make likely a decent compost, even if you incorporate some of these agents. I definitely rake up the leaves underneath the hickory trees. I don't exclude them. I rake up underneath my bird feeder and I throw that in. Um, I'm not all that concerned about coffee grounds, even though in the winter I tend to use more, I don't use that many. Um, it's anticipated that after six months to a year, a typical composting cycle, the level of undesirable organic species should be considerably re uh, reduced. And know that commercial composting operations actually use a bioassay use test. They will literally take something, uh, a, a potential stream they're gonna sell and plant seeds in it. Do the seeds come up? or take an established plant and plant it in compost. If it keels over, they need to dilute that stream with something that's less toxic. So commercial operations are doing this all the time. In terms of this last segment, um, and by the way, I hear the janitor coming down the hall. I may be visited in a minute by, by
by somebody coming in to empty my trash can here. Um, those bags from Starbucks, those silvery bags, if you've ever gotten them, um, include coffee filters along with the grounds. And definitely the worms absolutely adore my, uh, my, my offerings of, of coffee grounds. Uh, every couple of weeks they get a bag. But we also drink lots of tea at home and some bags are reported to be uh, compostable should they get included. And this led me to a kind of a impromptu study of, of these breakdown products or potential breakdown products. A growing area of concern in both commercial and home compost is the idea of microplastics. And in commercial operations, these generally come in from coated paper products, paper towels, plastic bags, stray plastic cutlery, and food packaging. In the backyard home uh, composter environment, we're talking about missing kitchen scrubbies, and we've all done it, um, paper towels, residues from plastic garbage bags, and ultimately items labeled as compostable, which exhibit incomplete breakdown, including those tea bags. So what's the problem? The problem with plastics is that although they're largely chemical inert, chemically inert, they exhibit substantial adsorptive properties. And that is not absorption where everything gets soaked in, but essentially sticking to the surface. And they are able to adsorb specific classes of organic compounds that they encounter. So if you remember back to chemistry class, like dissolves like, greasy or lipophilic molecules can stick to the surface of these microplastics. And remember, because they're so small, they have a tremendously high ratio of surface area to volume. So things like polyethylene and polypropylene, the two structures up top, can adsorb diesel fuel, dioxin, DDT, benzopyrene, pyrolysis products. Probably not glyphosate. Glyphosate is too polar and it probably wouldn't stick. But any number of greasy contaminants in the environment could definitely stick to the plastic. And then ultimately desorb these toxic materials somewhere else, depending on the chemical conditions they encounter. And again, remembering that these things are very, very tiny, they have the ability to pick up quite a bit on their very substantial surface area. Back to the coffee filters in the bags. I did a substantial amount of research on this and talked to some real experts in the field. And I found out that coffee filters are constructed from chemically modified cellulose. There's no sort of plastic strengthener in a coffee filter like the ones they use at Starbucks. Um, Every bit of data that I could locate would suggest that they're safe and they break down just about like anything else. Uh, and the worms seem to like them just fine. They get eaten up with everything else. So when you look at this picture in the upper right corner, this is uh, a picture that I took with my microscope and it's essentially just a mass of cellulose. But if you look at the picture of the bag, of the tea bag below it and focus your attention on sort of the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see kind of from, from the top arcing down to the bottom, you'll see a colored strand in there. That's plastic. That won't break down. It's mostly cellulose, but every time you see one of those colored strands, it's indicative of plastic. And so although that tea bag will break down some, it won't break down all the way. And the picture on the far left is uh, a Harney tea bag that they come in a nylon sachet. And I actually thought this was a very pretty picture. This is completely, totally um, synthetic and it will not break down. So coffee filters seem to be okay, uh, given the choice of putting in the whole tea bag and then having to fish it out later and leaving behind some microplastics. Better to open up the tea bag when you dump it um, into the bucket that you collect your, your waste for. In terms of how to know when compost is finished, Dawn talked about this in her talk. Um, what does it look like? Does it have residual organic raws still present? Uh, what's the texture? What's the consistency? I thought her slide about the, the ratio of mass to volume was really good. Um, what does it smell like? Uh, does it smell of this compound in the bottom right uh, called geosmin or earth smell? I actually had this for my students. I don't, I'll hold it at a decent distance. This is the three-dimensional structure of geosmin meaning earth smell. When you smell uh, 
mature compost, it's got that great earthy odor. And there is in fact, there was some research that was done using this, this molecule as a measure of compost completeness. There is also a test called the Dewar Health Self Heating Test, whereby you put compost into essentially a thermos bottle and you see how much the temperature goes up. That's an, an indication of how much microbiological uh, activity is still going on. And again, if it's heating up too much, it's not finished. Uh, bioassay use tests, again, are used in commercial operations. When compost is done, it almost always hits a pH of 6.7. Everything that I've ever looked at at URI when we've done kiosks and people have brought in finished compost, it always comes in around 6.7. Through the decomposition process, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, but always on the acid side. But it settles around 6.7. Now, again, whether it's, it's home compost, whether it's compost from a community compost area, um, the only exception would be if, if for example, at Yukon, where, where Dawn works, um, it's exclusively uh, animal manure, then it's different. There are different rules that are in play. Uh, and that actually tends to be slightly alkaline. In terms of testing compost in a laboratory environment, UMass discontinued their testing program in January of 17. Penn State does offer a basic compost test for 40 bucks and a highly advanced test panel that includes toxic metals and PCBs for 350 a sample, which is not cheap. Uh, University of Maine offers two tests at 55 and 65, but again, no tests for toxic metals or organics. And I want to go into this for just a second because there's no sort of omnibus test. There's no generalized test. We can look for certain things in a specific assay, but you can't look for everything in a single assay. And what do you look for? Do you look for 2,4-D? Do you look for 2,4-dichlorophenol? Do you look any number of generations through the decomposition process? So my message is make good choices and you don't really have to worry too much about getting the, the, the compost tested in a laboratory. It's, if it's a commercial operation, it's a different story. But for the home composter, try to make good choices and we'll talk about them in just a second. Um, to, to, to basically summarize this, when you compost, you divert a subset of organic materials from the waste stream and you can extend the useful life of our landfills. In Rhode Island, they're very, very protective of this because they only have the one landfill in Johnston. So anything they can do to keep things out of there will extend the life of the, of the facility. Know that you have to make good choices with organic raws. And if there's any doubt, you know, leave it out. But if you make good choices, if you, if you incorporate a mix of different streams, you will produce a product that is beneficial both to the health of the soil and the growth of the plants that are there. Know that humus, which is a wonderful uh, end product of this decomposition will enhance the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the soil that's lucky enough to be getting it. And know that composting, although it's a powerful degradation technique, it is not going to turn copper into something else. It's not going to turn lead or cadmium into a non-toxic form. They're there. Um, persistent organics like certain, you know, old-fashioned pesticides or herbicides, even antibiotics aren't likely to break down completely. And know that composting is a very time-honored practice that remains under very, very active uh, investigation, especially from the chemical perspective. Uh, I like to include a slide like this at the end because there's some fun stuff uh, that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, Cornell has a wonderful, wonderful soil manual that does include a little bit on compost, uh, as free as a download as a PDF. Uh, they also have a dedicated compost site, which is the third reference. It's wonderful. URI has uh, a lot of wonderful resources. Uh, University of Vermont is good. Uh, I love the site, site from Washington State where they, they explore uh, gardening myths. Uh, the Royal Horticultural Society, if you like your gardening with a British accent. And the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture is also quite good, especially if you happen to live in an area where it's a frost pocket, where you have a shorter growing season. In Ontario, they have to do a lot to bring in a crop. So their, their stuff tends to be uh, tied to short season gardening, which can be useful. Um, I have a great app on my phone from UC Davis, uh, the soil web app, which tells me what kind of soil is underneath me wherever I go. It's tracking my location and it's fun to see. 
Um, and I like, and this is a little off topic, but I like the PlantNet app for identifying plants um, that I happen to run into as I'm, as I'm wandering around. And the last slide is, so what's in your pile? And more importantly, what are you considering? And that's where we'll end today. So thank you, everybody. And I'm going to stop sharing. And I did not get a chance to see anything that was in the chat box. So you're going to have to read some back to me. Absolutely. Um, so Thank if you, you so much, Dr. Rafka. We appreciate you staying at school well beyond the school day. It's like um, a detention, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm still here after school, right? <laughs> Hopefully a little better than detention. Um, let's see, there were some questions and I'm trying to see where that started. Um, It Hopefully starts I, at 453, Chelsea. I actually am not seeing the timestamps at all. Um, okay. So I can I can pose the question and you can see it. Oh, I see them so actually. Are there any? Okay. Excellent. Go, go for it, Chelsea. All right. So a question for you, Dr. Rafka, uh, starts with, are there any natural products that can be added to the compost to promote the activity of microorganisms or natural enzymes for the degradation degradation of complex molecules. So I would, I, would, I would argue that that mixed waste stream is going to put a lot of things there. Essentially, you know, it, if you remember the movie, uh, what was if you build it, they will come, right? Um, if you put the right things out, field of dreams, I'm having a senior moment here. If, if you basically put the right things in, uh, any number of, of in, uh, environmental organisms are gonna colonize that pile and they're gonna take over. And as Don pointed out, a highly acidic pile is only going to basically be host of fungi. Um, a more neutral pile still on the acid side, which is slightly acidic, is now going to host bacteria, uh, actinomyces, which are sometimes now called actinobacteria. You're, there's gonna be just a wide range of things that can live in the pile and ultimately do their business in breaking down the material. All right, great. Um, uh, the next question I see is, can we use cedar in compost? So cedar is naturally rot resistant. If you think of like a cedar post in a, uh, you know, you, you've put in a fence post and it lasts, you know, generations. Um, cedar breaks down slowly. There are a lot of uh, natural compounds that would be in there that would hinder its decomposition. But again, I would, I would hearken back to the idea of the solution to pollution. Some cedar is going to break down, it's going to be fine. Um, but a lot of it probably is not going to break down too quickly. And again, I would worry about any number of, of cedar uh, chemical species that would, would build up in there that, that again, would be uh, in a proportion that would, would not be healthy. So a little, sure, a lot, no. We used to, we used to have a guinea pig and there, the guinea pig was for a while on like cedar shavings and whatever, and we threw them in and it didn't seem to make any difference. So next question. Great, um, thank you. And then um, we have a next person asking about um, the addition of pine needles in compost. So pine needles are interesting because pine needles contain a lot of tannins. Um, there is an initial burst of acidity as those tannic acids uh, wash away. One of the things that I've, I've coached people on is um, oftentimes people who want to plant uh, blueberries or cranberries in their property and their soil isn't acid enough. By putting a, a bed of pine needles, it not only prevents weed growth, but it also, as they wash in, um, adds some acidity to the, to the soil. Pine needles, again, I rake up around the, the back of the composter. There's some, there's some pines. Um, some, yes. Would I do it exclusively? No, because I do think they break down slowly. There is a waxy cuticle on a pine needle as well. And, and they do tend to break down slowly. And they do produce, at least initially, a burst of those tannins that will temporarily lower the pH. It will come back up, but they do break down slowly. But what, that, that actually does make them nice for other purposes, like, for example, as a mulch underneath uh, cranberries or blueberries. Great, thank you. Um, and then I see one more question um, from Peter Moon. 
Uh, it's a long one, so you may want to read it, but I'll read it out loud to you as well. All right, please. Uh, Dr. Rafka, time temperature pathogen destruction criteria for biosolids is 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours. The composting industry generally extend these same criteria to most other feedstocks. However, you indicated pile temperatures of 160 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for livestock manure, with but with no time component, can you clarify? So, so yeah, the University of Rhode Island's uh, criteria are pretty stringent. I mean, those are hot temperatures. Um, I would I would anticipate a couple of days, at least two three days, at those temperatures. You're cooking that pile. Um, I think in terms of biosolids and and in sort of specialty composting, that's where um, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise. I would, I would think, um, again, with, with biosolids, you want to, you want to make sure any pathogens are definitely killed off. Um, and again, in, in sort of questionable cases, I, I kind of, uh, hedge my bets. If I, if I have composted some stuff, uh, oftentimes in sort of a peripheral pile, I won't use it on food preps. And again, I take a very, very uh, stringent approach to anything I'm going to eat. If I'm making compost, that's eventually gonna wind up on my perennials or, or in sort of other remote areas of my yard away from the vegetable garden, I get a little bit more sort of carefree, if you will. Um, but I'm definitely very, very aware of what goes into that main pile because that's gonna eventually get cycled back to my main garden of 1300 square feet. Um, but in terms of, like I say, specialty stuff like biosolids and whatever, that's, that's where you, you probably have to go to the experts at Cornell or someplace like that, where they, they have more uh, experience in that area. Uh, my, my aim pretty much is, is uh, associated with home composting. Great, thank you. Um, the next thing I see uh, is a comment and a question. It says, you seem to prefer composting with worms. How do worms change this process? Are they preferred? All right, so, so that's, a, that's when, when I began composting probably in earnest, maybe about 35 years ago, we just ran a traditional pile and we, um, I turned it all the time, like Dawn said. I mean, I was always out there turning. And I came to realize that, that my composting sort of personality, if you will, is not that high energy. Um, I love the worms because there's no turning of the pile. Yes, they need slightly different food requirements, but essentially two weekends a year, I have to think about them. The rest of the time, I don't. So let me explain the cycle. So in the fall, I put a superstructure around the pile and I make a gap of about mm, 10 inches, eight to 10 inches. And I fill that gap with whatever I can get. Leaves, I used to use salt marche when I could get it. Anything that's organic and will essentially create insulation. I put some bags uh, of, of leaves up top to essentially act like a, 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 essentially a, a, a heat sink. I wanna, I wanna be able to, to put a solar collector up top because they do get some sunshine. Um, that's it. I, I insulate the pile, I feed them through the winter and life is good. Toward the end of April, the beginning of May, I remove the superstructure from around the pile and I remove the active layer or cap. If you've ever, you know, vermicelli, right? Little worms in Italian. The active layer has as many worms as it is, as it does organic material. And I gently lift that off and I put it off to the side. Everything underneath it, I dig out. I initially screen, I put it on my driveway. You saw the pictures. Um, I let it dry a little bit. I shoo the robins away because they think they've died and gone to heaven when they see all that. Um, but basically I sieve it to a half an inch, um, get the rough stuff that I'll put back in the pile for another cycle. And then I'll sieve once it dries a little bit more to a quarter of an inch to get back more material that isn't fully broken down and get the worms back to their friends. Um, and that's it. And then I have the compost, I store it someplace where it doesn't necessarily get a lot of weather, I'll put a tarp over it, and then use it during the course of the gardening season. Two weekends a year, and I put out literally one yellow bag, one town bag about once a month, um, and everything else really gets composted. We, we are very meticulous about what goes in. 
Um, but literally when we scrape our plates, everything that we don't eat or we peel away or whatever, the worms get a shot at. And they seem to be doing pretty well. The, the pile has been going continuously 27 years. So many generations of worms. And, they, and again, they, they do not get um, brought in for the winter. I always meekly suggest to my wife now of almost 40 years, um, couldn't we bring them in for the winter? They would love it. They're quiet. They, you know, they, they wouldn't bother anybody. And she's not very fond of that idea. But with proper insulation and with good feeding, including those, those bags of, of uh, coffee grounds, they do just fine. And come spring, there's lots and lots of worms to start the new season. Great, thank you. Um, I don't think I see additional questions. Um, folks are also welcome to unmute themselves if you wanna ask a question directly, um, but I'm happy to read them as well. Uh, there are a few um, closing things that I would like to share too, if, uh, if you all have a moment. Do you have a slide deck to share, Chelsea? Yes, I'm pulling that up. Okay. Are you seeing the slide deck? Yeah, you just need to expand it. Yes. So just it um, good. in closing, uh, we want to thank our partners. There are a lot of folks involved um, in the Connecticut Compost Alliance. Um, it is a voluntary, um, you know, passion project for all of us. Uh, and so it's really great to um, have so many great partners. And there are two more webinars coming up. Um, I will, yes, and I, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you again to Don Pantanelli and Dr. Rafka. These were really, really informative. Um, and there's one other piece that I really want to say. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit about this in case you don't all know about sustainable CT, which I hope you do. Um, I just want to say Sustainable CT is an organization that taps into the power of creating change at the local level, guided by the vision set by Connecticut's municipal leaders, over 200 people from local governments, nonprofits, state agencies, businesses, academia, and our communities work together to develop Sustainable CT. Uh, and each of Connecticut's 169 cities and towns were represented in the creation of the program which continues to guide, provide resources for, and support to municipalities to become more sustainable. Um, and they have a really amazing program called the Community Match Fund. Um, and that provides fast, flexible funding and support for different community projects, such as the Connecticut Compost Alliance. Um, we're seeking funds specifically to help with coordination of the compost series Every, every year, which includes paying speakers stipends, stipends for the tours, and for videographers to add to our video collection, um, which showcase successful composting activities in Connecticut. And with their community match found, uh, fund, the sustainable, C, sustainable CT um, donation is matched. So if you donate $25, your donation will become 50. $50 becomes 100 um, and that is um, donations are um, going to be doubled until April 22nd, which is Earth Day. So if you have um, enjoyed this series or any of our work in the past, we would appreciate that donation so much. And um, that link should be in the chat. And that is it. Um, so we now have uh, 15 minutes of free time or 15 minutes of questions for Dr. Rafka. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>